logistics to make sure you're all set and comfortable. Firstly, I hope you can hear us loud and clear. If not, please check your device settings to adjust the audio. Secondly, since we have people joining in from many different countries, please do try to use the Microsoft Teams built-in translation feature. So you can turn on the captioning by clicking on the CC button at the bottom right of your Teams live screen and use the gear button to switch to your local language. Teams will automatically translate the spoken words to your language of choice. And we want to make sure you all have a very interactive session, so please feel free to use the chat box to pose your questions to the speakers, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. If you encounter any technical difficulties, you can use the chat box to reach out to us, and we will help resolve them. And just the last final point, the event will be recorded, so if you choose to participate in the Microsoft Teams live event, your name, email address, phone number, and title may be viewable to other participants. All right, with that, Aviv, do you want to show them what's in store for them today? Yes, very excited to share our agenda for today. We have five exciting panels for you this morning, and I hope you find them inspiring. You will be hearing from industry and government leaders on citizen services, education, energy, and healthcare. The five sessions for today are Society and the Future of Work, Smart Nation and Cities in the Making, The New Energy Transition, Breaking Down the Walls to Create a Connected Customer, Patient, and Citizen Experience, and Reimagine Education. And look out for a very special video of personal stories from women in technology. Okay, with that, allow me to invite Sukhun, General Manager of Microsoft Southeast Asia New Markets, to officially kick us off with Deiru. Sukhun, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I hope you have had a great day yesterday. Distinguished speakers, industry and thought leaders, ladies and gentlemen, participants, welcome to day two of the summit. The name of the conference itself, Empowering Nations for a Digital Society, has taken on a more significant meaning. We've encountered so much adversity with the pandemic, but nothing could be more inspirational than the resilience we've witnessed the power of people, our governments and communities coming together for a purpose. To all the healthcare workers, thank you for continuing to serve at the front line. For educators, thank you for bringing classrooms to our children's homes. And for those of you in the government, thank you for doing what it takes to keep the lights on and serving the citizens. To businesses, Thank you for leading the digital acceleration to ensure business continuity. The pandemic has become a change force for nations. As the Malaysian Prime Minister, Right Honourable Muhyiddin Yassin said, digital way of life is no longer a catchphrase, it is a reality. As leaders, it's time to take collective actions and adopt future-proof technological investments to empower our people. It is also encouraging to hear from Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Thailand, Right Honourable Prayut Chan Ocha, on how Thailand is continuously investing in the country's digital infrastructure. While no organisation is 100% resilient, but those fortified by digital are more resilient. More and more organizations, governments are allocating their spend on technology. However, the speed, scale, and the exponential surge of transformation due to COVID has also made the divide more pervasive. Be it equality of digital access, health equity, or gender inclusion. And there is one common message that we've heard yesterday from every leader and every industry is the need of the hour to bring the collective strengths of public and private sectors to bridge the divide 
and empower the nations. Today, we will continue this energy and discuss about future-proofing our path forward, keeping people at the core. As we officially kick off day two of the summit, I would like to thank all of the 46 global leaders for coming together in advocating the common mission of empowering nations for a digital society. So with this, it is my great privilege and honor to bring on stage Brett Smith, President Microsoft, to give a keynote on future reimagine. Hello, I'm Brad Smith, Microsoft President, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to be with all of you, albeit virtually, on this second day of this conference. I think that the issues that you're discussing today, that you're hearing about, really I speak in my view to issues that are of global significance, of enormous importance, and perhaps are especially vital as we think about the future of the public sector across the Asia and Pacific region. We're obviously still working through enormous challenges around the world as a result of this pandemic. And while we're optimistic based on the countries that are making advances, especially in the distribution of vaccines, we all know that we have a very challenging set of months ahead. And yet at the same time, we also know that the best way to succeed once this pandemic does come to an end is to be prepared. And that's where I think so many of us around the world have been inspired, frankly, by the leadership of governments, especially across, say, Southeast Asia over the last year, where you all have been better prepared, in part because of the prior experience over the last decade with things like SARS and MERS and the like. Now we can look to the future. And I think one of the key lessons from this pandemic has been the enormous acceleration of digital technology. In truth, we've all had to get comfortable using digital technology to do new things. And along the way, what we've learned is that digital technology actually can help us accomplish more in our lives. It's enabled more people to experience telehealth services than ever before. It has forced more students to learn from home than ever before. It's caused workers to connect with each other from their homes like never before as well. And as we look to the future, we look to the opportunity to leave our homes, to reconnect in person. And yet we'll also, I think, look to a future that offers the best of both experiences, online and connected digital experiences, as well as experiences that bring us together in person. And I think it'll take months, perhaps even a couple of years for the dust fully to settle. But as it does, I think that the expectations of those around us will be altered as well. People will want at times to talk with a physician or a nurse or a healthcare practitioner online while also going to visit a doctor. And I think that is a scenario that will be multiplied across different parts of the economy and different parts of public service. What we can, I think, bet on for sure is that the governments and the companies and the NGOs that equip themselves with the capability to make the best of both in interactive and an in-person world are going to be at the forefront of what success is going to require. But there's three other things I want to talk about as well, because they too will need to come together to make the best of these scenarios possible. The first is to address head on what a new generation of technology is going to require of a new generation of people when it comes to skills. As jobs become more digital, people are going to need more digital skills. It's not just the people who say study computer science or concentrate in a field like data science or data analytics. The truth is all of us 
are going to need to learn some new skills. It doesn't matter where we are in our career or what our age happens to be or even the kind of work that we're doing. We saw this really ripple around the world in the 1990s as the personal computer found a foothold first in a, an office or two and then on everybody's desk and when it came to a smartphone, even everybody's pocket. We all needed to learn new digital skills. And as we look to a future with data visualization, with data analytics, with machine learning, with artificial intelligence, we won't all need a PhD but we're all going to need to learn something we don't know how to do today. That's why last year we at Microsoft launched our Global Skilling Initiative, an initiative that aimed to reach 25 million people and in fact has now reached 31 million people in 249 countries and territories around the world, even including 91 participants from Antarctica. It shows the global reach and the global desire by people to learn in this way. More than ever, what we've realized at Microsoft and with LinkedIn and GitHub that are parts of our company are that digital technology is part of the solution, that we can put content online, we can create opportunities for people to learn the kinds of skills and then prove their skills through certification programs that will then help them connect with jobs. But we also deeply appreciate just how vital it is to partner and work with and support governments as well. I've for a long time admired so much of the leadership we've seen coming out of Asia and the Pacific, real innovation by governments in investing in really the frontier of these kinds of skilling efforts. But the frontier is gonna move. And if we're gonna remain at the frontier, we need to move with it and we have even more opportunities to work together in the future. A second area that is clearly gonna require more attention, more focus, more intensity, and more collaboration by all of us is the protection of cybersecurity. Here too, we live in a changing world. And unfortunately here, we see our adversaries, certain nation states, developing and expanding very quickly the kinds of cyber capabilities that they are using oftentimes to, in effect, create new threats for all of us. And what starts oftentimes with nation states then has a way of rippling and spreading into cyber criminal organizations as well. The short story is we are constantly going to need to work together and invest in stronger cybersecurity protection. Certainly for a company like Microsoft, we readily recognize that in so many ways we have the first responsibility to protect cybersecurity. And we're expanding our own investments in new features and functionality, new training programs and education initiatives to make it easier to protect security by default. But we also recognize that this is not something that any tech company or even the entire tech sector can accomplish by itself. We need to work with our customers, public sector customers and customers across the economy, oftentimes small businesses and NGOs. We need to invest in the skilling of the cybersecurity workforce, an area where you're gonna see us take new initiative to support the creation of more trained people who can work for governments and others to protect cybersecurity. It's an area where we need to do more to encourage organizations to implement and use the cybersecurity protections that we are developing. The incidents of recent months have just reminded us so powerfully that in many instances, the organizations that are at the most vulnerable are in fact organizations that simply are not necessarily turning on and using the cybersecurity protection that their software actually enables. And we're gonna to need to work together, especially with governments, to strengthen the rules of the road, the international legal rules, that I just think are essential to put the kinds of attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructure that we've been seeing off limits. After all, 
We've lived in a world since 1949 where it's been understood that it is a moral responsibility and legal duty under international law of governments to protect civilians even in a time of war. And I think we should use that as inspiration to double down on our commitment to protect civilians and civilian infrastructure in what is supposed to be a time of peace. Even as we're doing these things, as we're using technology to transform and take forward the frontier of government services, even as we're expanding digital skilling, as we're strengthening cybersecurity, there's one more goal that is obviously of paramount importance as well. And that's the preservation and protection of the planet. We need to do everything, including these things, with a keen eye on sustainability. One of the things that we recognize is here too, technology is both a tool and a weapon, so to speak. We are seeing the massive construction of data centers all around the world. Data centers that are major consumers of power, of electricity. That's why we at Microsoft, as well as others across our industry, are working to make our operations more efficient. We're working to bring into our data centers by 2025 energy that is 100% driven by renewable energy sources. We need to be reducing our carbon emissions. That's why we at Microsoft have committed that by the end of this decade, we'll be carbon negative as a company. And we've committed that by 2050, we will remove from the environment all of the carbon that Microsoft has emitted since the company was founded in 1975. These are big numbers for our company, but the truth be told, they're actually small, they're tiny compared to the amount of carbon that the world needs to address. We need to aim collectively to be net zero as a planet by the middle of this century. And here, there is obviously not just an enormous responsibility and need for leadership by the public sector, but in a way that excites somebody like me, an enormous opportunity for technology to be part of the solution, to be one of the great tools that every industry can use to address its carbon issues. We're focused on that at Microsoft as well. We already have a carbon calculator that runs on our technology that any customer can use to measure and monitor and ultimately reduce the carbon emissions that result from its use of something like cloud services. But you're gonna see us in the coming months invest, deepen and expand the kinds of digital technology tools and services that we will be bringing to market so that every kind of organization in every part of the economy in every country around the world can harness this to better reduce their own carbon footprint. Ultimately, we recognize that the sustainability of the planet is actually bigger than the carbon challenge alone. That's why we've committed by the end of this decade to be water positive, to be a zero waste company, to build what we call a planetary computer that helps knit together all the world's data sets to better manage biodiversity. In so many ways, as we come together virtually in 2021, I think it's fair to say we live in one of the most challenging years in a century. When we see the devastating toll of COVID-19 on so many countries and populations, we live in a sobering time. And yet at the same time, I think we live in a decade of enormous opportunity ahead. And if there's one thing that gives me hope, it's the knowledge, the conviction that in the year 2030, we're gonna be talking a lot more about carbon than COVID. And we're not only gonna be talking about it, we're gonna be building on a decade of momentum. And I think that's what we need to aspire to do, to ensure that the rest of this decade, virtually the entire decade that remains ahead, is a decade that uses digital transformation to make us all better, not just as organizations, but as individuals, that adds to our skill set 
and does it in a way that keeps us secure and enables us to solve the biggest problems of our time. We appreciate the work that I know you all do every day. The enormous responsibility you have in the positions in government that really are fundamental for our societies in every country around the world. Our hope is to create the technology that will enable you to do even more and to empower us all to do more together. Thank you very much. Governments and public sector bodies are being challenged like never before, with issues both local and global in scale. From responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, to ensuring equity for citizens and communities. The pace of change is accelerating, while expectations rise. KPMG and Microsoft combine deep industry expertise with advanced technologies, strengthening our long-standing alliance to help you address complex public sector issues. Together, we can help modernize your organization and meet ever-evolving citizen expectations through flexible cloud-based and mobile-first solutions. We merge Microsoft's innovative leading-edge technologies with KPMG's insight for successful deployment. KPMG and Microsoft work collaboratively with you to drive broad and measurable impact. From building scalable smart city solutions to transforming data use for law enforcement agencies and helping to ensure relief payments reach the right people at the right time. At the heart of it all, meeting the needs of your most important customers, the citizens themselves. Thank you, Brad. Wasn't that amazing, Ankita? Yes, Aviv, and I love how Brad puts it. We won't all need a PhD, but we will need to learn new things as time changes, and that's so true. As the frontier moves, we need to move with it. Well said, Brad. And on that note, it's time to bring out our first panel and engage in a discussion about society and the future of work. Allow me to introduce Andrea Della Matea, President, Microsoft Asia Pacific, who will lead our panel discussion. Andrea, over to you. Good morning, and welcome to our panel discussion today. Over the past year, we've witnessed the impact of the pandemic economically, socio-politically, and culturally, and the subsequent ripple effects. It's fair to say our existing world view of how we live, work, travel, learn was challenged. And as a result, organizations had to make unprecedented and challenging decisions to ensure business and organization continuity, whilst also ensuring the health and safety of employees and citizens. And we also observed that organizations who were fortified by digital technology were more resilient and more capable of transforming in the midst of the crisis. Today, as economies emerge from the pandemic, leaders have the responsibility to lead through this recovery. And this presents the opportunity to hit refresh and to reimagine a new world, a more resilient future, smarter nations, cleaner and greener cities, equitable outcomes and inclusive prosperity for all. So in this panel today, we look to the future, at the economic revival, the societies and cities of tomorrow, across the key pillars of environment, human capital, innovation and digitization. We'll talk about how can we prepare and empower our nations and every citizen to be resilient have the ability to navigate and, of course, to thrive in a dynamic new digital world. It's my pleasure to introduce our three distinguished leaders 
Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nariman, the Deputy Minister at the Ministry of Labour in Thailand, Justice Midas, Head of Office of the Court Administration with the Supreme Court of the Philippines, and Roger Jones, Executive General Manager of Technology at Auckland Transport. So let's move to our first topic, embracing change. And Justice Midas, I'd like to start with you first. How has the pandemic shifted your perspectives and what transformation have you undertaken for your organization? How did you overcome any challenges? Oh, uh, thank you, Andrea, and uh, good day, everyone. Um, like many organizations, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, fast-tracked our digital transformation journey. The Supreme Court, the Philippine Supreme Court, being a, being a conservative organization, immediately realized that it has to adopt to modern technologies to ensure resiliency and for the courts to continue dispensing justice despite not being physically open. We have adopted the use of video conferencing to hear and decide cases, allowing parties to present their arguments and evidence remotely and even the public to observe these video conferencing hearings, subject to certain safeguards and conditions. We have likewise allowed the filing of pleadings and other court submissions online. And we were able to do this with hardly any mentoring for our judges and court personnel. They likewise adopted instantly. In fact, following this momentum, we have partnered with a local digital bank to develop an e-payment solution which uh, hopefully before the year ends will allow any litigant to pay court fees using um, uh, online uh, various modes, um, uh, various modes and channels of payment, such as a credit card, uh, online banking, and the uh, digital wallet, among others. So we hope to be able to continue with what we've started uh, even after this pandemic. Thank you, Justice Midas. It's interesting to hear you talk about the need to fast track digital transformation whilst also ensuring certain safeguards for the public. Roger, I'd like to turn to you next, please. How has the pandemic shifted your perspectives and what transformation have you undertaken for your organisation? So Auckland Transport uh, runs a lot of public transport, so buses, ferries and rails. It was quite um, significant, there's two things in the, involved in this. One is uh, the removal of cash as a result of COVID, so cash fares and going to essentially no cash on the buses in order to um, to keep that, that sort of handling of, of money down to a minimum. And we haven't brought that back yet, we haven't brought cash back. So that's a big change for me citizens as a whole, that suddenly transport is an option if you don't have money you get them anyway, but you do, if you have an electronic card, you're expected to pay. And what we've seen is society has picked up and does does tag on and tag off and does pay. And it's a very small percentage of people that um, use the system um, with, with no cash. It also meant a big shift. So what used to be collaboration tools, which were great, they were just one of those things that technology provided that you use now and again, it suddenly became an essential part of everybody's day. So the uptake of Teams and, and video conferencing was enormous. And in the first month alone, we did 2 million minutes of meetings as a company. So that was really you know, an experience. As the previous uh, speaker mentioned, we didn't do a lot of training. This, people just picked this up. And so suddenly that something that was quite difficult to use before COVID was suddenly very easy to use when they had to. The other big thing was people got to know each other. People became a little bit more caring. And that's not just the employees, but it's the people you're interacting with. Because everybody was working remotely and, and feeling it a little bit, People were a little bit more conscious about people's welfares. You know, there were uh, informal drink, you know, drink sessions over video, morning teas. People took the time to ask how others were doing. So we have seen that, and we've seen since we sort of dropped out of the COVID lockdowns, that some of that caring has dropped off. 
some of those informal chats and sessions have dropped. Our productivity went up. We're not sure if that is because people use the time that they used to travel to and from work um, as extra work time. But what we did notice from our back end was that there were less people on team calls over time. So the number of participants dropped. That sort of indicated that the meetings became more focused. It also meant that we had to think up ways of managing staff welfare remotely. How did we know that people were safe? And if you think about domestic violence and things like that, people working from home in a locked up environment with their family, those things come front of mind. So we reinvented the company a little bit around how we managed and provided support for our staff during that process. Roger, I think you, you make some very fair points that many other organisations could relate to. I love the fact you talked about externally, the removal of cash as a result of COVID and that you haven't brought that back. And you've seen citizens really embrace that change. But then also internally, where you talked about as an organisation and leadership, you have to think about how to manage staff welfare, particularly working from home and to have that front of mind. Thank you for giving both an internal and an external view. And Dr. Nariman, I'd love to hear from you as well. How has the pandemic shifted your perspectives? What transformation have you undertaken for your organization? Well, first, just to give you the figure, here in Thailand, we have roughly about 37 million people in our labor force. About 17 million of them are former workers, and the rest, 20 million of them are informal ones. Since last year, like in many other countries, Many of the Thai workers have been badly affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. A number of them got laid off and some had to change their life work. The Royal Thai Government and Ministry of Labor has implemented several measures to help our workers go through this very difficult time. Such measures include something like providing cash support for three months and then extend it to six months and special loans. We also provided job opportunities and offering skill development programs. It is our top priority to make sure that Thai workers are well equipped and empowered for the present and the upcoming future after the pandemic. The Department of Skill Development here at Ministry of Labor has been working continuously with many partners to provide training courses to ensure that our labor force can learn necessarily professional and digital skills. We try to take this crisis as the opportunity to upskill and reskill most of the Thai workers by applying on site and online training programs, which we hope will ultimately boost their employability, their digital citizenship, and build more sustainable economic foundations for the country. Having mentioned that, we understand that many of the former workers may not be able to return to the former work. So after finishing the training program with us, they may choose to start their own business. And to do that, they need financing resources. So we have worked with the Thai Credit Guarantee Corporation to ensure that they can have easy access to affordable financing resources. Thank you. I think it's incredible when you think of a, a country as big as Thailand and you refer to the 37 million workers, and many of the Thai workers who are badly impacted and laid off and having to change work. It's really heartening to hear about the measures that you're implementing during these difficult times around cash support and special loans, as well as working with partners on training courses to help build the digital skills to upskill and reskill. And I love your comments around um, also being there to support others who may want to be starting businesses of their own. I know in Thailand, you're looking to build a vibrant startup um, community. Thank you for sharing. So with that, let's move to the second topic for today, which is around the next era of transformation. And Roger, I'd like to start with you first. What are your top three priorities that anchor how you're reimagining your organization and the support that you provide over the upcoming three to five years. And we'd love to hear if there's a particular in initiative that you're proud of. 
So I think over the next three to five years, what we see is the, the transformation that's been forced on us by COVID in the ways that we work um, will continue. So our big company focus at the moment is coming up with a new way of working. Um, and that includes a culture shift. It includes being more inclusive, more customer focused. And how do we do that using the new collaboration tool sets? And I think this is sort of driven home, you know, in the old days we all traveled for conferences and we got to know people in networks. As we move forward, it's going to be harder and harder to justify, especially in New Zealand's case, traveling for 12 hours on an airplane to attend a, a one or a two day conference. Given that we've just survived the last 18 months or so or a year um, doing it all online. So the shift to online is driving a whole new way of working. People are not coming back to work as often. And we've seen this across our public transport network. Out of our regular customers uh, that used to travel five days a week, now a lot of that is down to three days a week and people are working from home on those other two days. We're seeing that reflected across the workforce generally in the city, that more and more offices are reducing and allowing staff to be working flexibly at home. So this becomes a, a big question about how do you build culture? How do you come up with new ways of working? How often do people come into the office? Um, and what's the new ways of onboarding staff? Do they even have to come in on their first day or are they completely onboarded remotely? Do they even have to work in the city? Um, can they work remotely? The other big area is our supply chain. So what came to us is that we're an essential business and we assumed that people like our road uh, maintenance companies, we had no idea when COVID hit how their supply chain worked. So could they access the bitumen and the cement and the supplies they needed to keep the road network working in an emergency? So having visibility of the end-to-end -end supply chain for us is a new um, business process that we're getting to grips with. I think our best result was our ability to change so within a week on our public transport network, we were able to show in real time how many how many people were on a vehicle. So what the capacity was in terms of passenger numbers on a bus in real time at each stop, taking into account the required social distancing capacity of those buses. So that gave us a real visibility, gave customers real visibility of whether the bus was full, whether it was going to be full. Um, and we got a lot of public um, confidence back about traveling on public transport as a result of that. Thanks, Roger. I think you make a really good point. Not only do organizations have to consider the shift online and how that's driving a new way of working, the technology to enable that, but also as organizations are now allowing staff to work from home in the new world moving forward, how do you continue to be mindful and intentional around culture and this cultural shift that organiza organizations are seeing? Thank you. Um, Dr. Nariman, I'd love to hear from you next, please. What are your top three priorities or initiatives that anchor how you're reimagining your organization over the next three to five years? And if there's an initiative that you're particularly proud of? Well, in the next three to five years, we expect that Ministry of Labor will play a major role in reducing social disparities and boosting economic growth for Thailand. Well, to achieve that goal, we must work on dual tracks. That's what we believe. The one track is to develop our labor force for the work of the future. That will require digital skills, for example. And the other track is to heighten the job opportunities for the vulnerable groups, such as people with disabilities, the old age, and the low income groups. We have initiated the um, build, boost, and bring policy here at Ministry of Labor. First, we have a plan to build our labor with future skills that meet the significant demands from 12 new s curve industries in our special economic zones. In addition, we continue to boost skill standards for our workers through skill development program and skill standard tests. And we try to make sure that they earn higher income 
when they pass skill center test. Last but not least, and this is actually came from my own passion because it came from a very poor family. And I come this far because I got the opportunity from the government, I got a scholarship. So I want to bring more opportunities to the vulnerable groups. We want to bring more career opportunities to them so that they can have a better, not only better, but also sustainable living qualities. To achieve all of this, we have to work closely with several public and private sectors. And I truly hope that Microsoft will actually join us in the future, in the build and boost and bring better future for the Thai workers here. Thank you, Dr. Nariman. And I appreciate you touching a little on your journey and to hear you talk about the need to reduce social disparity and improve economic growth, but also ensure sustainable living qualities. I couldn't agree more. It does take public and private sectors and organisations um, coming together to achieve more. And it's certainly something we'd love to work more with your organisation to impact the societies and the lives across Thailand. So with that, <clears throat> Justice Midas, I'd like to turn to you, please. Uh, thank Give you. Give you um, your top three priorities or initiatives that anchor how you're reimagining your organization. Okay, thank you, Andrea. First, uh, since we have accelerated our quest for a digital transformation, we have to make sure that we will be able to properly manage these assets and resources, optimize risks, align strategies, measure performance and value service delivery. Thus, it is crucial to have a modern enterprise information governance framework. Second, we, we, we also have to make sure that all our judges and court personnel are fully aware of the changes that are brought by digital transformation and that they are able to adapt to these changes. Thus, a change management program should be in place and should be regularly reviewed to make sure that we don't leave any of our judges and court personnel behind. Then I think we also have to have continuous training on ICT and cybersecurity. Digital technologies will certainly play a crucial role in the coming decades. We are now discussing utilizing AI for se several scenarios and use cases. Thus, we have to start training and equipping our personnel and judges both technical and non-technical, with up-to-date skill sets on ICT literacy and awareness, develop a culture of cybersecurity to make sure that we can truly be resilient and be able to pivot quickly and adopt modern ways of work using modern technologies. And if there's something I can share, an initiative I'm uh, particularly proud of, mm -hmm. well, that would be the conduct of video conferencing hearings. In one year, we were able to do some 242,905 video conferencing hearings nationwide, uh, 226,109 of which uh, concern criminal cases. And all these video conferencing hearings with a success rate of 87.65%. We have also released 84,285 inmates or persons deprived of liberty through video conferencing hearings. The use of video conferencing hearing technology to conduct court hearings were in fact considered impossible prior to COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm proud to share that the court was able to immediately devise these out-of-the-box solutions for our continued court operations. Uh, Justice Midas, I think you said it in incredibly well. To imagine the justice system using technology for video conferencing and hearings, we, we would not have even been talking about this a year and a half, two years ago. But in one year, 249,000 plus cases and liberating 84,000 plus people. Um, that's incredible. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. So moving on to <laughs> our third and final topic for the panel today, it's around skilling and the future of talent. Justice Midas, I would like to start with you first. How do you see the role of technology shaping the future of justice and the differentiated impact of court services to citizens? Uh, as I've said earlier, the technology will play a crucial role in dispensing justice. 
We want to make sure that every citizen will be able to access justice, not only through traditional methods, but also through technology such as the internet. Imagine having able to file a pleading online while you're in, a, in your car or while you're, uh, while you're vacationing in the beach in Boracay, having able to pay court fees like paying or checking your cart on Amazon, Shopee, or Lazada, having able to monitor the status of cases like monitoring the status of your Facebook or Instagram posts, no? and eventually having AI assist legal practitioners on legal research like how Siri, Cortana, or Google Assistant assist us in making phone calls or crafting text messages. All these are possible, I think, and all these are in the pipeline. Justice embedded with technology. I like that, justice embedded with technology. So every citizen is able to access justice through technology. Thank you. Uh, Roger, moving to you, how are you thinking about building a more inclusive society from the perspective of urban mobility, smart city infrastructure, and accessibility for people living with disabilities? So I think the key for us is um, smart cities is, is evolving over time and, and the transformation of this shift to working from home drives a different mentality. So more and more people are working out in the suburbs and a lot of public transport, a lot of facilities were aimed at getting those people into the central city. Now they go to their local shopping centres and malls and things. How do people get the information and have access to technology regardless of their disability and whether that disability is permanent or temporary, um, how do they get the information they need to make those travel choices? The first and last leg, you know, the, the mobility scooters, um, powered scooters, powered bikes are becoming more and more um, accessible out in those suburbs. They're becoming more the norm, but you need to combine that into a combined journey. As we bring in new modes of transport, um, electric vehicles and things, um, pop, you know, shared cars, on-demand car rides and things, how do we integrate those into an information um, centre where people can access the information to make their own travel choices, understand both the climate and the cost impacts of using those in, in terms of public transport or some other form of transport versus a private vehicle. But at the same time, we have to make it easier and better for the tradespeople around the city to be able to do their business. People still have to be able to go and service the fridges and the freezers in the local shops. They still need to get into those central city spaces to do that, and they need to be able to take their tools with them. So whilst city centres want to become more, more people friendly and more people open spaces, we still have to accommodate those repair people and those service goods. And how do we do that? And, and is that a mode shift? Is it changing behaviour patterns and culture to, to servicing outside of normal hours? There's a whole raft of cultural things that as a city we have to, have to address. But a lot of it is based on information and the city needs to provide an, an information hub where people can access it. We can't be the provider of that information to everybody but we should be the provider of the data that allows other third parties and Googles and Microsofts of the world to build applications that can access the data and turn it into information for our, for our citizens and for our visitors. So I think it's, it's a change. As more and more people have got used to working remotely and online, they've got a, the expectations have changed from um, just having a normal service to be actually able to see everything online and do transactions online. Thanks, Roger. Uh, look, I couldn't agree more. The way you talk about bringing together and creating this information hub where different providers can provide information for people to access because smart cities are evolving. There is a shift to work from home and that's changing the dynamic of city versus people working in the suburbs. And that does mean giving access to people to make travel choices, regardless if the disability is permanent or temporary, uh, is crucial. And integrating different modes of transport, really interesting to hear you talking about, uh, talking about that element as well. Uh, Dr. Nariman, I'd like to turn to you now, please. What are the most important skills 
that will prepare your country's workforce for the future? And how can public and private partnerships, and you touched on this a little earlier, be improved so employability, skills, inclusion and technology can be best utilised? Well, we believe that digital skill is a crucial part of building resilience to economic and social shocks resulted from the COVID-19 pandemic. It's imperative for labor force to have both professional and digital skills in order to adapt to the new normal. It is true that the advancement of technology creates new career opportunities, but to be able to take that advantage, our workforce needs to learn new skills. Realizing that, we have established, we call this that stand for Digital Skill Development Academy, which is a new agency to oversee the planning and executing of the development of digital skills for the Thai workers. This that will play an important role as a forward-looking institution that providing that, that will provide digital skill training programs for not only the workers to enter the digital workforce, but also for Thai people including vulnerable groups to bridge the gap, the, the gap of disparity in digital literacy. To be successful, this does adopt PPP model to operate our three key functions, the infrastructure, the platform, and the contents. For the infrastructure function, we work with the National Telecom Public Company Limited, or we call it NT, and CatBots Company to make sure that our workers across Thailand can have affordable and efficient internet access. We start working with Microsoft and other local partners to build a single platform, which is user-friendly and cost-effective. And for the contents, we are working with several partners in developing cutting-edge digital contents and skill standard assessment. Ministry of Labor has secured partnership with Microsoft Thailand to upskill 4 million Thais nationwide to ensure opportunity to all workforce, including women and people with disabilities. To this public and private partnership, Microsoft has provided digital skills knowledge via Microsoft Learning Courses, covering numerous courses in Thai language, including modern productivity application and digital essentials for beginners and new businesses, as well as in-demand technical skills related to widely used Microsoft products and services and that's in English. We are certain that with this type of PPP model, our people can improve both digital skills and employability. Dr. Nauerman, look, I couldn't agree more. Digital skills are crucial to build resilience and to help our citizens adopt to the new normal. And we're uh, equally excited to be working with you to upskill 4 million people across um, Thailand, including women and people with disabilities, to ensure that no one is left behind and that we provide the same opportunities for all. So in the last few minutes, as we wrap today's dialogue, I'd like to end on perhaps a little more altruistic note as we look longer term towards the future. So I'd like to ask each of you, what changes would you hope to see? Justice Midas, can I start with you first, please? Okay. Uh, thank you, Andrea. First, uh, let me let me uh, take this opportunity to congratulate the entire Microsoft family for the successful test on establishing an underwater data center. This highlights the commitment of Microsoft to optimize and maximize the use of technology without the expense of our ecological environment. So congratulations on that and thank you. Um, I hope to see the technology companies and providers like Microsoft would continue harnessing the limitless potential of technology to improve our ways of life and continue to relentlessly strive in helping our governments across the world in revolutionizing public service, especially access to justice. Those, thank you very much. Thank you, Justice Midas. Roger, can I turn to you, please? As we look longer term towards the future, what changes would you hope to see? 
I think uh, more companies need to follow the leads of Microsoft and become um, more environmentally friendly. And I think that's going to create challenges. It's going to create new industry opportunities. It's going to create new digital opportunities, you know, as we go into new technologies. But it's also going to create potential new issues like what do you do with old batteries? What do you do with some of these old items that need to be recycled? So I think technology has a lot not only to bring this stuff to, to use and how you use it and how you can optimize it, but also to help how we recycle it and, and get the benefit out of it and add to the green environment. Thank you, Roger. And Dr. Nariman, would love to hear from you, please. As we look longer term towards the future, what changes would you hope to see? Well, I think as we all expect, many countries will undergo digital transformation and the workforce will eventually have to also transform to a digital ecosystem. We have been discussing a lot about building a, um, or getting ready for the digital ecosystem, but not enough for me, I think, not enough on how to make it a healthy one. Digital ecosystem, as we all know, are frequently created by and controlled by also market share leaders, like Microsoft, for example. So what I hope to see in the future is this. I hope to see that Microsoft and all of us here can work together and trying to help each other to create a healthy digital ecosystem. I'm talking about how can we increase digital inclusion, coalitions to address country and global challenges of the pandemic. For example, growing economic and digital inequality or how to empower civil society to address digital disinformation and the characteristic of digital information in ecosystem that enable the manipulation of public discourse. That's what I hope to see in the future. Thank you, Dr. Nariman. It's time to close on the session today. So thank you to our panelists for a lively discussion. It was fascinating to hear your comments and perspectives, and we're equally grateful to partner with you as we strive to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Naramon, Justice Miras, Roger, and Andrea. Really love the insights you brought to the table about you know, resilience and inclusion into every aspect of our society today. All right, Avi, what's next on our agenda? We heard from Brad and the panel just now on the shift towards a digital society. Now. Let's get into that fireside chat about smart nations and the future of cities and the critical role of the public sector to be an agent of change. Allow me to introduce Julia Glidden, Corporate Vice President, Worldwide Public Sector, and Sherry Ung, General Manager, Public Sector Asia Pacific. Sherry and Julia, over to you. A beacon of women tech leadership and a bird lover for nature and snow sports. My guest today is one of the top 100 most influential people in digital government. She's also the advisor to the United Nations, the World Economic Forum and the European Commission. Today, we're so honoured to have with us Dr. Julia Gleden, our Corporate Vice President for Worldwide Public Sector on the topic of smart nations and cities in the making. Welcome, Julia. Thanks so much, Sherry, and thanks to all of you for inviting me. There's so much great smart city innovation happening in APEC. It's just one of my favorite parts of the world to, to learn about what's hot, what's next, and what's coming to a, to a city near us in the U.S., so thank you. Julia, we're so excited to have you with us this morning. I can feel the energy oozing from the screen already. Julia, there's so much rapid you know, digital transformation, not just in Asia Pacific, but around the world. Can you share with us some of your observations about how government are modernizing towards smart city? You know, Sherry, someone who has been working with the European Commission on the smart city agenda, I'm gonna date myself, but really going back to 2005, 2006, this is probably the most exciting time in the world to be working in the smart space because under the pressure of the pandemic, the pressure of the moment, the need, we saw, you know, Sacha said we saw two years of innovation in two months. I think in public sector, we saw 20 years of innovation over the past year. And nowhere have we seen that more than in smart, 
right? Because suddenly the risk of doing nothing for public sector, which we understand why public sector has been risk averse, lives are at stake, the health of a society is at stake, people's wellness is at stake if we get something wrong, but suddenly under the pressure of a pandemic, the risk of doing nothing became higher than the risk of doing something. And once that pressure was unleashed, the power of innovation, of bringing together cloud and data and AI to make our cities cleaner and greener, our transportation system run better, our hospitals work more efficiently remotely because they had to, um, delivering remote healthcare, delivering remote justice. It's been truly a transformational time. Julia, super well said. We're seeing unprecedented rapid deployment. 20 years of transformation is unfolding before our eyes in just the last 12 months. Tell us, Julia, what are the biggest challenges and opportunities uh, for public sector in digital transformation? Well, we have an unprecedented, we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to really, really build upon the innovation that was unleashed during COVID and the advances that we made. The advances in the Philippines were under the pressure of COVID, the Supreme Court rapidly shifted the country to digital justice. Um, the, the ability that, that we had to transform um, in India, that we're going to have to transform in Indonesia, where we're building our second data center, and we're going to be bringing digital skilling to 24 million Indonesians. Um, because we've been able to firsthand move from pilot to unprecedented rapid deployment, bringing together the, the new technologies that are fueled by by cloud, that are empowered by data and AI, by ubiquitous technology that's, a, that's available at a more cost-effective and scalable model than ever before. Because these factors were all brought together in COVID, we've got a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Now, what's the challenge? The challenge is COVID pressures, please go back and, and recede and we go back to the next normal, if not the new normal, if not normal. But if we go back to normal, that's a challenge because normal is risk aversion at the cost of innovation and improvement and embracing smart. Normal is um, slow, is, is testing things out incrementally, it's the land of pilots. And I think all of us in the smart city space know, and I would say APAC has been a great exception to the rule, but you know, smart cities have been lost in that piloting and then you pilot and then you pilot. Now, what I love about APEC is you guys take pilot in on your national smart city agenda. You actually make it real, but there is a danger that we're gonna lose some of the momentum and go back to business as usual, start moving things back on prem, lose the urgency of the moment, forget the real um, transformational change that happened under COVID because civil society was at stake. Like the fabric of civil society was held together by smart innovation. And I think it's up to us all to seize the opportunity of building upon it and resist the challenge of going back to business as usual. Hey, Julia, we're all standing on the cusp of one of the most exciting time in human history. However, we all need a new mindset if we want to fully exploit the opportunities set before us. Tell us about the role of government in shaping the digital culture as well as growing the digital talent pool. Well, you know, leaving leaving no one behind is is a is a mission that is very dear, near and dear to all of us at Microsoft, at all of our hearts, because our mission is to empower each and every individual and organization on the planet to do more. And we know that as we're moving into a digital age, the 21st century is the digital century. The post-COVID world is the digital world because without digital society, as I just said, would not have been able to hold together. We would not have been able to meet people in need, to meet the healthcare needs, to keep public safety um, running, to keep the court systems running. So as we move into um, the new normal, the post-COVID world, there's going to be a greater pressure than ever before on governments to skill their own people. We know governments by definition have a skill shortage. They're not Silicon Valley. They can't throw gobs and gobs of money at people and, and bring in always, you know, the, the best talent at scale. They bring in the best talent, make no mistake about it. The best people in the world drive innovation in public sector. But we in the private sector have a real 
duty. We have an obligation to facilitate digital skilling, not just across societies to train the workforce for the next normal in a post-COVID world, but to help our public sector partners train their own people to embrace digital, to implement digital. And, and that's why I'm so proud of the work that Microsoft has done with the UN and digital skilling in refugee camps. And the, and the real initiative we've rolled out in that, Sherry, you know you and your teams have, have, have deployed so successfully across APAC, you know, we set out a goal on LinkedIn when COVID started to, to skill 25 million people to, to enter the workforce in the post-COVID world. And we have now surpassed 30 million thanks to the great work you've done in, uh, in the APAC region, again, leading the way when it comes to forging the new normal. Thank you, Julia. I love what you just said, that this is the digital century. I would just add that this is the Asian digital century. Now, Julia, let's turn our eyes to something slightly different on the topic of trust. Tell us, how can we foster greater trust between government and the citizens? Trust, 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 trust and trust. I don't think there's anything um, more fundamental. I think great strides were made under COVID in, in, in cementing a greater trusted relationship between citizen and the government because of the way technology was able to bring people together and, as I said, keep fundamental services still running. But we also know, and we know more than anyone at Microsoft, the dangers of cybersecurity, the rise in unprecedented rise in cyber attacks, the importance of ensuring that that when we give our data, when citizens give our data to us, or we as citizens give our data to government, um, that, that that data is protected, that it's secure, that there are policies in place, that there are frameworks, legal and regulatory frameworks in place to protect our data, to protect our personhood. And I believe that we can only enhance that trust by thinking about the way we work together, mm -hmm. the, the private sector, the public sector, civil society, the third society, NGOs in partnership, true partnership, a true partnership that's rooted in, in advancing transparency because trust comes from partnership and transparency. And it's only in that way that we can build the right regulatory frameworks to protect our data, the right legal frameworks to ensure privacy. And then as we're moving into what is a potentially amazing new world, where we'll have more personalized services and more um, seamlessly delivered services, more easily accessible services to those most in need, fueled by data and AI, we of course have to make sure that we don't have biases in those services, that we embed the human in those services, that we never forget what we're all hungry for during COVID, which is the human touch. We miss the human touch and we cannot ever, despite all the amazing things we've done with technology, including my ability to be with you all today, nothing replaces the hug. Nothing replaces looking someone in the eye and, and, and being human together. And so I would urge us to trust transparency and, and, and embedding the human in everything we do. How true, Julia. Trust, trust, trust that comes from transparency and partnership and embedding the human element in everything that we do. Julia, you have been such an inspiration and a force in digitizing government. Can you leave us with what should public sector leaders keep as top of mind as they adapt their culture and continue to chart the future for their nations? Gosh, Sherry, you don't ask small questions, do you? Um, it's spot on. The time is now. This is a historic inflection point in digital government. As someone who's devoted my career to advancing the use of technology to make our societies better, to make them more equitable, to make them more just, to make our public services more citizen-centric was the original word, and now citizen-driven, where we co-create, to create those personalized services that meet us where we are and when we need them in the way we, that is most accessible to us. I come back to the word partnership. This is the era of partnership. Nobody can do it alone. I can't sit at Microsoft and, and divine what, what governments need. Governments can't sit alone and divine what citizens need. Citizens can't sit alone and say, hey, this is what I need from you, government, because I don't even often know what governments offer. 
But technology allows us to co-create in an agile and, and cooperative, collaborative way, the citizen um, service framework of the future. And so I think the future is really bright. I think the onus is on all of us to make sure it is bright, that we avoid those pitfalls, that we make sure data and AI is ethically deployed, avoids bias, that our data is protected, that our citizens trust us. And I think it all really comes back to embracing that sense of human-centered partnerships as together we look to build upon what is one of the bright spots coming out of this dreadful COVID year, which is the power of technology, not just to hold civil society together, but to transform our societies for a better world all around. This is indeed a historical moment for all of us, an era of partnership, and the time to act is now. Thank you, Julia, for always inspiring us with the vision of a purpose-driven digital, using tech innovation to drive business and societal outcomes for common good. That we should all look to the decade ahead of us and put the best of digital technology to work, to protect people's fundamental rights, to preserve trust, develop digital skills, ensuring that we leave no man behind. As we reimagine our new world, for better, greener, and more equitable outcomes for all. Thank you for joining us at Empowering Nations for a Digital Society. In the book Moment of Lift, Melinda Gates mentioned every woman should be able to use her voice and pursue her potential, that women and men should all work together to take down the barriers and end the biases that still hold women back. In this series, Women of Wonder, we bring to you inspiring stories of how women in this region have blazed the trail of breaking barriers and pursuing their destinies in STEM. Hi, I'm Zingyi from Singapore. I'm currently a data scientist in HTX. My name is Kirutika. I work at the Science Centre Singapore. I'm Leila Etachi uh, from New Zealand, Auckland. I'm AI and Data Platform MVP. And also, I co-founder of the company named Radhika. My name is Hong Fuk Dang. I am originally from Vietnam and uh, I am the founder of Force Asia, the biggest open source community in Southeast Asia. I'm Sudi from Singapore. I'm the debut writer from HDX. I used to be a statistician and enjoy working with numbers, so I just wanted to take a chance to explore other techniques uh, beyond uh, using the traditional regression methods. Hence, uh, I, I started reading a master's in a relevant field and uh, venturing into this tech space. So it has to do a lot with, uh, with open source community. Uh, Back in the, in my university, I got a chance to um, uh, to take part in the Linux, uh, the local Linux user group, where I learned how to in, in install um, Linux machine and also pick up some coding from the people in the community. Uh, I was really inspired by uh, by their energy, um, enthusiasm on uh, contributing to uh, to different technology. There's a lot of opportunity to learn and to exchange knowledge. So um, I grew up in a developing country like Vietnam. You know, you don't get a, a lot exposed to the international environment. But I was really surprised being part of the open source community. It means that you can connect with people from all over the world. One thing that we know when we are talking about gender diversity gap is that it starts really young. So for girls, we give them dolls and for boys, we give them train sets when, they, when they're young, right? And then that is a very implicit message that goes and grows up as with our girls as they grow older. So to bridge the gender diversity gap, it has to start very, very young, um, almost from the moment that a child is born. And which is why one of the things that we do is uh, we work with parents to, to tell them a little bit more about the importance of STEM, in, in society, in girls, in, uh, for, for everyone. Exposure to science and technology should start from young. Back then, I'm, a few, uh, I'm one of the few students pursuing my engineering degree. Today, girls are exposed to coding, science and technology at a younger age. Even my five years old daughter are actually learning robotics in her school. Do you love Cohen? 
On the day she gave birth, she helped create the uh, abort guidance system that rescued Apollo 13 uh, astronauts. So she's juggle work and uh, family like a pro. My favorite at this point of time is Rosalind Franklin because uh, if you look at her story, you'll find that she actually believed in the need for experiments, data, mathematics, and their role in the generation of good science. And that's what science is all about. I do not have a specific hero that I look upon. I derive inspiration from the leaders and the people I work with by observing and relating to my personal goals. Just believe in their uh, strength and believe that they can um, kind of be good in their career and uh, kind of try to sound themselves with the good people that they are supportive with a woman like them be connected to the other woman that they are in this career yes they are few but if they know each other it can be really good talk to people um, who are into STEM, um, talk to your teachers, talk to industry um, professionals in science and technology. Um, at the same time, try to attend um, workshops, camps, programs where you can work on projects and prototypes and build up your portfolio. Just go ahead and pursue your interest. Uh, nothing is all that scary or too daunting out there. So even if you are the only female in this entire conglomerate of male out there, um, um, you, you can just, it doesn't put you at any disadvantage at all. So your ideas and tenacity would actually stand up. Imagine a future where we use data analytics to drive change for a more equitable world. Where your new products launch at the pace that your consumer preferences change. Where governments of the world collaborate to create better social outcomes for their citizens. EY and Microsoft are realizing that future now. EY and Microsoft's relationship is unique. Two industry leaders who are partners and customers of each other. Microsoft technology is critical to EY, from how we work to how we serve our clients. EY has deep capabilities on Microsoft technologies that help our clients solve their biggest problems and innovate with confidence. Together, EY and Microsoft deliver transformations driven by people and powered by technology. Whether that's a new driver that quickly needs pay-as-you-go car insurance, a tax accountant asked to run a last-minute analysis and still make it home in time for dinner. Or the concerned social worker that is trying to assess risk for her new case across disparate government and agency data. Our portfolio of innovation solutions help ensure that technology transformation and innovation meet genuine needs. The world is changing. Are you ready? EY and Microsoft can help you accelerate that change. Together, we deliver transformations driven by people and powered by technology. Thank you, Julia and Sherry. Your message on how one size does not fit all really resonates with me and I think as we think about the Asia Pacific. And putting citizens in the center of digital transformation makes all the difference. Now let's talk about sustainability and climate action that sits on top, uh, top of mind of every leader's agenda. So up next, we have a very exciting panel discussion on the new energy transition led by Daryl Willis, Corporate Vice President of Energy Industry at Microsoft. Over to you, Daryl. With that, this morning I'm privileged to introduce three distinguished leaders of their fields. Please join me in welcoming Suchi Sanyao, General Manager of Computational Science at Shell. She leads a team of 50 researchers in developing cutting edge digital innovation solutions at Shell. And she brings over 20 years of experience in corporate R&D between Shell and GE. She specializes in advanced digitization techniques for accelerated discovery of materials and systems design of energy applications. I'd also like to introduce uh, Eric Anderson, 
who is the head of geoscience solutions exploration upstream at Petronas, leading Petronas's exploration's next generation technology plan, which is designed to maximize uncertainty and minimize uncertainty using digital methods, minimize uncertainty using digital methods, I should say, using uh, also building on and expanding their use of cloud computing and best practices. Eric's got over 30 years of experience uh, as a manager, as an interpreter, and a technical specialist in quantitative interpretation. And lastly, I'd like to introduce Regina Mill, who is the global head of energy at KM, KPMG. I had a chance to meet Regina back in 2019 at the Adipec conference in Abu Dhabi. She's a recognized thought leader on the disruptive trends facing the various segments of the energy value chain. And she brings nearly 30 years of experience delivering large scale business and technology changes to major companies around the world. Thank you all for joining us today. And I'll start by saying that in the past year, we have witnessed the world in every industry pushing the envelopes of science, of technology and innovation to lead the combat of the pandemic on all fronts and to overcome the challenges associated with it. And as leaders, we all are now laser focused on the economic recovery and building out the organizations to be building out our organizations to be more resilient, to be more secure as we embrace the value of digital and the value of agility. And so I have a question for all three of you, and we'll start with uh, you, Eric. And the question is, can you share your top three priorities and or digital initiatives across the short, medium, and long term, and how any learnings from the pandemic have influenced those priorities? Over to you, Eric. Yeah, thanks, Daryl. Thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah, Petronas, we, we started our digital transformation journey about two years ago. The impact of the pandemic and the concurrent industry volatilities has driven the need and the pace to accelerate digital transformation and create value. In this context, our top three priorities are cost optimization and efficiency, building a new competitive business solution and push for sustainable future. To do this, we're, we're going to do this by value chain visibility and analytics, smart plant and facility operations, measuring and reducing energy consumption, developing a generative HSSE uh, culture aided by advanced analytics and retooling our talents. At Petronas, we view technology as a differentiator, uh, digital as an accelerator, and data as an asset. Through technology and intelligent delivery, such as cloud automation and modern engineering, we're accelerating our techno-digital solutions to create value at pace. We firmly believe digital is, uh, is, must deliver tangible new value. Digital promotes collaboration across multiple disciplines and businesses. And by creating end-to-end -end value chain from offshore plants, refineries, and products for a sing on a single digital platform, we've been able to squeeze a maximum value out of each molecule produced. Our core focus now is doing more with less, especially in getting digital capabilities and user experience at lower cost. We've embarked on a, on a, on a group-wide digital transformation centered around themes of creating a data-driven organization, adopting new ways of working, and delivering new value for stakeholders and partners. At Petronas, we responded well to the COVID crisis uh, by ensuring our digital infrastructure was ready and cyber secure to enable remote work. For example, we accelerated the deployment of Microsoft 365 within weeks to enable everybody to connect and share data on a single collaborative pat platform while working from home. In exploration, we've transformed the way we, our explorers are, are prepared and process large volumes of data in the subsurface data on cloud through collaborations and key industry players such as Microsoft, Schlumberger, Halliburton and others. And moving to the cloud has enabled our teams to work in vast amounts of data at lower cost from any device anywhere with an internet connection. This has enabled us to compress various processes from months down to weeks and further down to hours. For example, it used to take two weeks to send data from Houston to Malaysia via tape. It takes now hours within cloud capability. And big data is the core of our upstream business. In fact, data, our data inventory is more than 70 petabytes, which is equivalent to about 15 million DVDs for those that remember DVDs. Uh, the data has powered our various pursuits globally and helped us to get us where we are today. And ultimately, we believe that mastering the data at scale the ability to generate insights at pace and precision is the digital competitive advantage. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. And, and as you said, time, that the, the ability to compress time is huge. Uh, Sushi, what are your thoughts? Uh, 
about those questions around those uh, priorities, short, medium and long term priorities and how you've responded to the pandemic. Absolutely. Daryl, first off, a great panel and really excited to be here today morning. And um, indeed, we are re we are going through unprecedented times, right? And what I resonate with what Eric said in terms of building our digital capabilities over the years. But what we see during the pandemic over the past year and this as well is an accelerated uptake of these digital capabilities all across our assets, right? And indeed, there was a joke going around for a while that the um, biggest accelerator of digital change and transformation has been the pandem pandemic over anything else, right? Mm -hmm. But what has aided this uptake, this acceleration is our readiness, right? Is the fact that we have been building capability over years now, right? And to come back to your question, um, Daryl, uh, I would I would highlight three things, right? The first one is digitizing the core, right? Where we are finding uh, immense economic value that we bring to the table, not only for Shell, but for our customers, our collaborators, our partners, by adopting large scale artificial intelligence and machine learning models. We are working closely with you guys, with Microsoft to deploy say 65 plus AI based applications, right? All across our assets. And all of these are generating immense value from an operations perspective, but also in terms of the energy transition, right? And what's really differentiated, Daryl, for us is the ability to complement these database models with physics based models as and when needed, right? And that happens for our energy transition apps, assets, for example, wherein we may lack data, right? Take hydrogen, for example, you know, wherein our computational researchers are leveraging our year long expertise in thermodynamic modeling, something that we've, we've been using for reservoir simulations, but now for designing safer hydrogen storage and transport, right? How cool is that? So essentially, we are integrating data-based models, physics-based models for digitizing our core. Now, the second part of this is essentially about customer centricity, right? We mm -hmm. are co-creating all of these solutions, keeping close to customers, and we are essentially walking the journey along with them. It's not a hammer and nail approach that, hey, we've got this capability and so we got to uh, adopt that, but essentially sitting with customers and saying, hey, what are the biggest problems worth solving in the space of digitalization and energy transition? And here I can give you an example which is really close to my heart because it's back uh, closer to home in India, you know, wherein we are collaborating with manufacturing sectors, hard to abet industries, you know, like steel and cement, mm -hmm. right? Um, wherein we are developing systems modeling to optimize and churn out optionalities for their net zero uh, journey. And there we are making some progress and this can only happen together, right? And the third piece of this, Daryl, which you know as well, is the cultural transformation that we need for all of this to adapt this large scale digital and energy transition, right? That has come by a very successful program, which is the Shell.AI change management program. And that essentially has enabled all of us to put and focus our efforts to establish common language of digital transformation across our company and elsewhere, right? It has brought in 5,000 plus community practitioners, 1,000 plus citizen data scientists, and upskilling our people with Shell.ai residence programs, Udacity programs. But essentially these three things, Daryl, if I can stitch back, you know, digitizing our core, customers at our heart, and then cultural transformations such as Shell.ai. This is what has been helping our uptake during the pandemic as well, right? Thank you for that, uh, Suchi. And I, I must say that the whole, you, you, you ended with the cultural piece, which is huge, because I think there's, a, there's an intellectual component to this journey, but there's a cultural piece of this journey that I think is underappreciated. So Regina, we've heard from a, a forward-leaning national oil company, and we've heard from one of the largest and most progressive international energy companies What's your perspective uh, on this particular uh, question? Well, I just want to echo what Suchi said, and that is, how cool is that? I mean, I think what Eric and Suchi just talked about just demonstrates the value of digital and what technology has enabled, and the fact that the pandemic has just skyrocketed us um, decades beyond probably where we would have been, you know, had we not had this major disruption. A couple things that I would just add 
Data, data, data is absolutely critical. That is the foundational element. And if you don't have good data to build off of, then you're not going to be able to leverage these technologies. So digitizing the core, I think, as Suchi mentioned, uh, and the emphasis on data that Eric mentioned, that's where we're seeing our clients trying to retrench. So those that don't have really solid enterprise data sets or they haven't figured out how to better manage the data lakes that they have because they're so, you know, petabytes you know, zytobytes, all of those, the, the, the amount of data is vast, but the potential is huge. The The use cases are quite evolved. So, you know, we were all just focused on, can we get collaborating, collaboration tools in place? I had clients that didn't even have VPN access with, with um, employees that didn't even have, you know, personal laptops, right? So they moved trading functions completely remote they moved 24 7 operations completely remote they started up new assets new plants completely remote maybe they sent one or two physical people to those sites and the rest of the technical resources were remote if you just think about what we've accomplished as an industry using technology it's phenomenal other use cases are really looking at the hydrocarbon supply chain and understanding the optionality of where you can make those choices and really seeing where value is created Similarly, for the well, the well site and the production platform and the whole exploration piece that Eric mentioned. And then the one thing I would add that we didn't talk about, but it's an incredible vulnerability, and that's cyber threats. Now that we're all working from home and the remote access, and we have the crown jewels in a lot of senses, you know, on our laptops. So in my business, understanding and respecting the cyber uh, threats and vulnerabilities that have been created in this new environment has become a, a, a critical differentiator as well. So happy to be here, Daryl. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for your uh, comments and bringing bringing that question to it. And I'd like to move on to a, uh, a second question and uh, start by saying, you know, as an industry, um, we all believe that there's strength in numbers and building alliances is becoming more and more important particularly uh, those alliances among peers and unusual suspects and partnerships uh, being created with companies like uh, KPMG and with companies like Microsoft as we look to the Petronases and Shells and others of the world. Also, there's this interesting OSDU platform that brings together the industry to share, to share non-differentiating technology, accelerate innovation and the overall transformation of the industry. But I think, you know, about other things, for example, uh, climate change. Climate change is a global scale challenge that cannot be resolved by any single nation or any single organization. It requires a concerted effort and collaboration across multiple companies and countries, frankly, in order for us to deliver on the ambitions around uh, uh, 2030 and beyond. So I'll, I have some specific questions for each of you, and I'll start this time with uh, with Shell, with Sushi. Um, sustainability and climate action is higher on the national agenda of every government leader, Suchi. How do you see the role of digital technologies being an enabler of the energy transition? Absolutely, Daryl. You 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 hit the nail on the head, right? So we are living in interesting times where these two mega trends, right, digitalization and energy transition, are influencing um, our lives. It's gonna have greater influence on societies, customers, and markets more than ever in the coming decade or so, right? And like you rightly said, this journey cannot be led alone. There is no single organization, nation, government, or society that can do it alone, right? And hence the key to leading this journey, to leading society in this journey, would be indeed partnerships, strategic alliances, right? And where we can complement our capabilities to push the boundaries of these technologies faster and further, right? Maybe I'll start with um, uh, closer to home, Daryl, and it may sound um, preaching to the choir if I tell you about our partnerships with Microsoft, right? Uh, but for the benefit of the audience, right? So we have a multi-decade partnership that we have been evolving over years uh, on multiple things digital, right? But what we did last year, what I was, what I thought spectacular in terms of consolidating in a strategic alliance with Microsoft and Shell, right, which talks specifically about net zero, which talks specifically about energy and climate change, which really seals the deal on our commitment together on how can we help our assets as well as assets of our customers and suppliers and collaborators in this net zero journey, right? To me, that speaks a lot in terms of bringing in our complementing capabilities, but for the 
bigger goal of climate change for the bigger goal of where we can take energy transition next for our society, right? Daryl, I would like to give you one more example, right? Now from the energy sector, you were talking about unusual partnerships and here's an example, right? So um, you know that Shell has been a market leader in lubricant space, right? And uh, we have decade long technological expertise. We have a lab in Hamburg. And what we did last year is our computational researchers, they built a very cool thermal management model for EV batteries, which actually tests different fluids for their effectiveness in cooling the batteries during charging and discharging, particularly important during fast charging, you can imagine, right? So in that, what came out was that the Shell E fluids have an enormous edge. It has 30% efficacy in cooling EV batteries over the market competitors, right? And that helped us in not only securing an IP position in this space, but helped us partner with Austrian battery manufacturer Chrysler Electric, you know, who are the leading battery manufacturers in the EV space so that together we can bring better battery solutions to the society. Now, that's what I call as a non-conventional partnership, uh, uh, extending our, our age old uh, expertise in lubricants, current expertise in digital and computational, and then penetrating into the EV and energy transition space, right? So uh, feel very excited to be actually forging much more alliances with you and with everybody else, Daryl, in this space. All right, so wonderful example, Sushi, how the, the traditional international oil company is really thinking about itself more holistically as an energy company and helping to think about a big problem. The, the example around batteries is huge and, 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 and it's got to be solved if we're going to see this journey from five million cars today on the road to something like 50 million EVs on the road by 2050 or so. Eric, I'm going to come to you now and, uh, and Petronas, and I want you to tell me a little bit about the potential opportunities that you guys at Petronas see or you would like to see strengthened as a coalition um, that we could collectively use to drive the energy sector forward. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Daryl. Um, yeah, you know, now that the world's becoming a global um, entity, everybody's becoming more c connected, it's becoming harder and harder to be or it's becoming easier and easier to work together to collaborate. In the past, we're, we're software companies and technology companies were, were working on their own, you know, as their own and being very individualistic. It became very difficult to collaborate. But now we're starting to see a lot more information being shared. There's a lot more focus on the data, not so much on the application. It's the application is good, but how you have that ap application, have you have that access to the data itself. The, you know, everybody has their data in drawers and storage for years and years in various locations. And it became very siloed of what we're doing. And that was not only within the oil business, in the oil companies or any other business, but within the industry as well. So, and you mentioned, you know, you mentioned Daryl OSDU, you know, and OSDU yes. is, Petronas is one, of the, is one of the 197 members of the global subsurface data universe. The OSDU database is to s consolidate and centralize and unify and standardize the data to make it software agnostic or other inf applications can come and go. So it's a community that's achieved a s significant milestone. And by implementing uh, industry leading software as a service for EMP data back in July. And with many new concepts and people and companies, they often take the wait and see approach before they make a commitment. You know, with this approach, it could be years before a company sees value in the process of the technology if you stand on the side and wait for others to see what happens. With OSDU, Petronas became a progress, uh, progress from a participant to an implementer. And I mentioned before, accelerating our techno digital solutions to create value at increased pace is, is a priority of ours. And with the implementation within Petronas, we, we aim to liberate, uh, liberate about a thousand times more EMP data for our users uh, with re and reduced complexity. And this is done by reducing the number of our siloed corporate data stores. We're going from 12 uh, corporate data stores down to a single data platform. You know, in this case, we're starting, we, we, we believe we'll start to see immediately translate into 10% lower data management and infrastructure cost in the next two years. And implementation of OSDU at Petronas positions upstream among the leading operators and signals our commitment to progressive and open data ENP ecosystems in Malaysia for both Petronas and our partners. Now, I should also point out the collaboration is not just about data and OSDU. You were mentioning our next generation technology plan, uh, which is we're into our second year of doing that. And uh, so 
our goal is to build an integrated data-driven GNG solution from basin to reservoir that spans across the full exploration development life cycle seamlessly on a digital platform. The idea is to reduce time, the time it takes to mature a prospect from what could be years to months. And this is through collaboration, it's through integration, it's through data sharing, it's through seamless, uh, seamless collaboration, not just within our business, within our specialist teams and within our assets in Brazil and Mexico and on the planet, but also within our industry, with our partners and other areas we see. So, so it's a really ambitious plan. When you say we're going to mature a prospect, by the time we're going to move into a block, I know, Daryl, you got some background in the, in the old business and you say, okay, we're moving into a base and, and right. within months, we're going to mature a prospect. You know, we got to be nimble in this space. We 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 have to be quick. We have to make fast decisions, and we have to make good decisions. Yes. So, yeah, in order to do this, you have to do this in a time frame that we have to be. Uh, you know, time and value are the are the biggest buzzwords for the day, right? And and we have to work together as an industry. So, and in order for us to do that, a Petronas, you know, we don't build. We don't see. We build. We partner, and that's how we feel we're going to make our solutions. Thanks. Fantastic, Gary. And um. This whole notion of liberating data is huge, and I'm so glad you brought it up because I think that uh, we don't talk about it enough, and there's so much data across the industry that needs to be liberated. Now, Regina, I promise you I'm not going to come to you on every question last, but I think <laughs> there are certain questions I'm coming to you last intentionally because I think you can offer us a, a broader a broader perspective. And my question for you is around governments and how can energy companies partner with governments to build a robust framework for carbon market and dynamics with, with sufficient enough incentives to attract investments and to build out a, a bit of a, a, a buffet, a bouquet, you, I would say, of carbon services, i.e. carbon management. What are your thoughts? It's a critical question, Daryl, because we only have one planet and one atmosphere and carbon molecules don't have passports, right? They're emitted and they become a shared atmosphere. And if government and industry don't lock arms, hold hands and figure out how we're gonna solve this together, we're just not gonna ultimately get there. The most critical thing, or I would say there's two really critical things. One is the ability to bridge public and private financing. And we've done some work with the World Economic Forum on a program about how do you accelerate investment in sustainable energy technologies and use public financing to maybe de-risk some of the earlier stage investing and then attract the private financing when things are ready to scale so that we don't have the valley of death with some of these great ideas that ultimately don't come to fruition. So the ability to bridge public-private financing is absolutely critical. And then I think the second piece is we can't pick winners and losers. The outcome needs to be decarbonizing the planet, trying to achieve a two degree C or better scenario without saying there's a winner or a loser. It's got to be solar or wind or, you know, carbon has to be re-injected into the earth or it has to be recreated in hydrogen. And that's where the struggle is right now, because different governments are more biased toward different outcomes, carbon sequestration being the prime example, right? Europe's going hydrogen. The U.S. is incentivizing re-injection into the ground. Until we can all come together, and I'm, I have big hopes for COP26 and being in Glasgow and what we'll be able to achieve so that we can work together as one planet, one atmosphere, and recognizing that carbon molecules, as I said, don't don't carry passports. They sure don't. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regina. I'd like to switch. I'd like to switch topics now and um, and move on to talking about the workforce of the future and maybe a little bit about diversity and inclusion. So we're seeing a shift of more efficient operations from many of the traditional lower skilled roles like roustabouts to maintenance workers to higher skilled, digitally focused uh, work with more fluid fluency required in, in, the, in the language of digital. There are rapid advances in artificial intelligence and robotics and emerging technologies that are happening. And frankly, they're happening over shorter cycles, changing the very nature of most of the work that's being done across the industry and the skills that are needed to do that work. In an evolving digital world, 62% of Generation Z sees energy sector roles today as unappealing. So, Regina, I'm going to come to you for this question. What are the top in demand skills that you're looking out for when you hire new employees? And how are you reskilling, upskilling your existing workforce 
And what are you seeing in the industry as companies think about that? Um, and what do you think is most important to an organization, to your organization or to organizations more broadly? Well, I think we, we look for a, a few of the C's. So critical thinking, collaboration, and communication. And, and I don't know that uh, the programs that are in schools today focus on on those things. So it's it's sort of a new skill set. I think the next generation, they're digital natives, right? So my 12-year-old son, who I had to kick off his video game so I could get on this, I, that's how they collaborate. They, you know, they're on, they're online together. They they are gonna be so much better at digital than we are. I think from a how do you upskill, reskill, I would go to what Suchi talked about earlier with you know getting your the dinosaurs like me, who I'm not tech savvy getting us comfortable with the tools. And, and frankly, the pandemic has helped a lot with that. But the, I, I focus on the three Cs, right? It's critical thinking, communication, collaboration. Um, and the key for us in this industry, and I'm gonna speak from an energy industry perspective, it's how do we bring sexy back? You know, this industry is going through a fundamental transition. We can make the planet great again, and if, and we will lead from the front. How do we better tell that story to the next generation so that we make it attractive and make them want to be a part of us? Those are the off things I would offer. Thank you. Thank you. I love that notion of making the planet great again. So thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Eric, I'm going to you. What are the top and skill demands you're looking out for when you hire new employees? And what are you doing to reskill and upskill existing employees? And what do you think, and what do you think is most important for your organization? Yeah. Thanks, Daryl. Uh, yeah. In our new, uh, Petronas has a statement of purpose, and uh, that goes like, uh, we're a progressive energy solutions partner in reaching lives for a sustainable future. And the intent of that is clear. In, in being progressive, we provide the state and the, the, the space and the, for agile innovations for our people to develop new capabilities and accelerate value. By focusing on, on progress over perfection, we're able to imagine, test, pivot, scale ideas quickly. These agile capabilities coupled with new skills and data analytics will help us convert these ideas and insights to solutions faster and, under, and undertake new challenges and also relook at old challenges that can now be solved differently. You know, having look backs, look ahead, having that information, trying to see what's going on. You often hear about, the, you know, somebody making a discovery, whether it's a, it doesn't matter if it's archaeology or something in a library or something in their back room. People find new things all the time by looking at things differently and having a better understanding of how things are put together. And these various platforms enable this. Our, from our innovation engine technology program, our involvement in the various digital programs, building and in, in, in pursued in the business, you know, these are all opportunities for people to learn. And one of the most important skills to elevate is our mastery of the data. In today's world, data exponentially generated compared to a few years ago. You know, mm -hmm. as our industry becomes more and more marginal and complex, our pace, uh, the pace to see between the lines to, or to, to see through the data, to detect the threats, the opportunities, to find how successful we are, uh, you know, are, uh, are digitally, uh, within a digitally enabled organization, it's, it makes it much easier to be able to do that. You're, you're able to look at, at viewpoints from many different angles. And we believe that this is not skilled for a certain few. You know, there was years ago, remember, we used to we used to have Oracle DBAs and nobody, you know, it wasn't a very sexy job. Right. But data science, you know, there's a whole program. There's university degrees now in data science, artificial intelligence, learning, you know, machine learning. There's all these things. So these things need to be within the DNA of the future. In responding to these needs, Upstream and Group Digital within Petronas have collaborated and launched what's called the Citizen Analytics Program for Upstream. This program has trained around 621 upstream employees from various sectors and disciplines to be competent in basic data engineering, visualization, and analytics. And we do this by using, you know, on the, on the most basic terms, we do this by using Power BI enterprise tools that self-produce reports, dashboards, analytics to support decision making at all levels in the uh, of the organization. And it not only elevates our digital competency, but it also helps reduce the cost of appointing third parties and vendors to develop these reports and dashboards for us. There's a lot more internal work, a lot more understanding of our own business. And we don't need, you know, rather than outsourcing other people to try to understand our business, we have a better understanding of our own business by doing this. So one of our examples is our reserves reporting. It's now purely digitized, presented on Power BI to our executive leadership and our board, board of directors. 
And this enables better appreciation of the vast information in the report and the ability to slice and dice the data on the fly and during discussions. No longer is it like a PowerPoint, here's the data, here's the report, here's the document in your email. You're now able to get the information from the various elements that you, for which your business operates under. So, and in, you know, and in addition, both Regina and, and Suchi mentioned this, Petronas, like others in our peer group, we're in the midst of a global push towards energy transition. You know, reducing carbon footprint is a corporate initiative and, and retooling our geoscientists to consider new and innovative methods for exploration and development has become a priority. It used to be we have a lot of specialists, a lot of people that are very focused in one dimension, one domain. And, and they, they work in that domain potentially for their entire career and they, they, they're very siloed in how they operate. So, so from, from now, from exploring a new basins for low CO2, CO2 sequestration, investing alternative energy sources, we require greater lateral thinking across multiple disciplines and data domains. What happens in the engineering world, for example, in shale, do, uh, translates directly into how we're, we're working in the, in the subsurface in, 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 in shales or how we're looking at different data sets. You have to have that mass understanding across lateral. So you have to have an understanding of data again, how you can mm -hmm. incorporate that data into your, your need. So providing easy access to technology and information, allowing our young geoscientists to become innovative, you know, they become the solution builders of the future. So, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Eric. And, and, and Suchi, I'm going to come to you with a DNI. We're going to close out this section with a, 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 a DNI question. So I'll come to you. Um, the, uh, but I wanted to say a few words. The, in, the industry is uh, widely regarded as one of the least gender diverse parts of the economy. And the energy sector, we know, needs to shift in itself towards drawing on all of the talent, talents that are available, especially as we think about providing affordable and sustainable energy in the future. And according to the IEA, Although women make up 48% of the global workforce, they only account for 22% of the labor force in oil and gas and 32% of the labor force in renewables. And so my question for you, Suchi, is gender diversity in the energy sector is vital. We know that. And it drives more innovation. It drives more inclusion, um, especially as we think about the clean energy transition that is, or the energy transition that is underway. What is Shell doing to increase the index of, uh, of women in the industry? Absolutely, Daryl, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, we we really need to be a needle mover in this context, right? And as an energy professional, as a woman energy professional in this space for over 20 years, I'm very, very passionate about this topic. It touches my heart, right? Yes. Um, and it definitely starts with leadership intent and visibility, right? Um, so earlier this year, we announced our new corporate strategy, which we call as Powering Progress, right? Powering Progress sets out our commitment, our strategy to accelerate our energy transition towards net zero, right? And that's something that we all as energy professionals are committed to, right? But what touched my heart is in that same strategy document when Ben, our CEO, announced of our commitment towards diversity and inclusion also and made it public, made our commitment and our target setting very, very public, saying that we will work to achieve 30% representation of women in our top 1400 leaders, right? And that's by end of this year, 35% in another five years, that is 2025, and then 40% by 2030. So you can imagine uh, from your earlier statistics, that is indeed a leap forward, right? And so it starts with that goal setting. It starts with that intent. And then how do we do it? How are we doing it now, right? The way we yeah. are addressing the talent attraction is essentially really focused look at what are our gaps, right? Which sections of our organization are underrepresented, right? Um, and essentially women in STEM, and we all know that Regina would resonate with me on that. Uh, so would Eric and you, Daryl, that certainly we need to be really focusing on women in STEM workforce in terms of really encouraging right from girls taking up STEM in their schools. We have lots of programs in Shell that do that. We partner with uh, 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 academics and institutions like MIT to essentially encourage girls in STEM. We partner with uh, other organizations to bring in women in STEM initiatives. And in fact, that's one of the ways how I came into Shell a few years ago with my background from GE in power and utilities, right? And I'm very passionate and committed to therefore build that legacy forward, right? Now that's only entry at the door and that's 
probably as, uh, addressing our D question. The bigger question, as we all know, as leaders in this space is the I piece, right? Once we are in the door, through the door, how can we include everyone? How can we build a culture of inclusion in the workplace so that we have retention, right? So that we have growth of the women in workplace. And that's the biggest piece indeed, addressing the cultural aspect, right? And here, I, we have about 96 networks all around the globe, certainly women's networks, women's development, um, uh, training programs, leadership programs, which help us build the community of inclusion, you know. And personally, Daryl, if I would allude to my experience, I went to one such program, which is called the Senior Women Leadership Development Program, right? And while it had many, many crucial elements of leadership development, including, say, building executive presence or uh, managing interpersonal conflict, all of these things, what really stuck with me was a module of peer coaching. You know, so throughout one year, we were allotted groups of similar women of similar profile, women leaders all across the company. So I have now friends from Singapore, Malaysia, Nigeria, Houston, who we collaborated on ground level problems on really, hey, this is the situation I'm facing. What would you have done in this, right? And to me, that's a deal maker, Daryl, right? Because that's when we start feeling a bit lonely at the top, isn't it? Uh, when we see fewer representation at the workplace. So all of these initiatives, Daryl, um, of bringing in people, so in terms of mm -hmm. talent attraction, but more importantly, in terms of building communities, building an inclusive culture is what I firmly believe is going to move the needle towards that dream future that you're talking about, right? Thank you so much, uh, Sushi, for sharing uh, those reflections. Folks, we're almost out of town. We've got two minutes, but I've got a big question. So and I'm going to give you each 30 seconds to answer this question before we wrap up. And it's really, I'd love to get your thoughts. I'm going to start with you, Regine. I'd love to get your thoughts on what are you most looking forward to as you think about the future of energy for the industry? Over to you, Regina. I, my utopia is that us in the fossil fuel industry are considered the leaders going forward. I want us to drive the narrative, seize back the narrative, and know that we are going to lead from the front because the world cannot achieve its decarbonization goals without us. So I hope that we are driving from the front and everyone starts to recognize that. Awesome. Eric, over to you. What are your thoughts? I actually think it's exciting times. Um, there's always been, you know, ever since I was in school, like uh, a million years ago, energy was going to come to an end. <laughs> you know, there's going to be, you know, no more energy. It's all going to dry up. It's never happened. It's just becoming more and more difficult and more information that's that more, you know, more, more challenging. And now we're moving into new energy and transformation. And this evolution is what makes it makes it interesting. This is what makes it fun. You know, we're looking at virtual reality, augmented reality, new ways of looking, machine learning, data analytics. We couldn't do that years ago. We're in the perfect storm now of networks, collaboration, co cloud computing that enables us to do these things. And it's it's actually exciting times. I, would, I wouldn't say people should not enter the industry. I think this is a good time to get into the industry. Fully agree. Thank you, Eric. Sushi, no pressure. You're going to close us out. What are your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, it's my it's my pleasure, and I, and I totally echo Eric and Regina in there and join in their excitement in this, right? So coming from India, where I grew up, seeing energy access to be a problem, I dream of a future, guys. I dream of a future, Daryl, wherein we will be the change makers, where we will make the future using digital transformation, using energy transition, make energy cool again for our Gen Next, and right. essentially make this planet our one and only planet. We have no planet B, as Regina said, make this planet the green and the place and the place that we would all want to live, right? So, and we have the last say in this. We have to make this future. Awesome. Thank you all. Sushi, Regina, Eric, thank you so much. We are honored and humbled to have you join us. We thank you for all you're doing and we thank you for the partnership with Microsoft mm -hmm. and, uh, and look forward to working with you on these big challenges going forward. Thank you all so much for everything that thank you're doing you. to deliver energy to the world. Yeah, Indeed. thank you very much, Daryl. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, bye thank bye. you. Bye-bye. The cloud and mobility are creating a mega shift that's disrupting 30 years of networking and security infrastructure. Let me share with you why a traditional network 
and security architecture is no longer suitable for the cloud and mobile first world. Applications are moving to SaaS and to public clouds. The users are no longer sitting in the office. They are working from everywhere, but security is still anchored to the data center. Until now, Zscaler is redefining network security. We are a pioneer in cloud security and are a market leader. Today, the Zscaler cloud protects more than 2,800 customers with users in over 185 countries. More than 200 of the Forbes Global 2000 count on Zscaler to help them move securely to the cloud. During peak periods, our cloud processes almost 40 billion transactions per day. It blocks more than 100 million threats every day and performs over 120,000 unique security updates to keep users safe. Zscaler has a massive opportunity to replace that network security market. And in the process, we offer our customers the opportunity to substantially reduce spending on expensive networking infrastructure as they embrace a mobile-first and a cloud-first strategy. Thank you, Suchmita, Eric, Regina, and Daryl. The power of building these strong partnerships and ecosystems will truly accelerate innovation and transformation for the industry in ways previously not imagined. All right. With that, we would like to bring in a very exciting panel on breaking down the walls, connected customer, connected thinking, and connected experience. We have three industry leaders coming together on this panel, so without further ado, let's call upon our panel host, Ricky Kapoor, Vice President, Sales and Marketing and Operations, Microsoft Asia Pacific. Ricky, over to you. Welcome, everyone. Firstly, and most importantly, I hope you're all staying safe and doing well, and I hope your families are doing well, too, in this, uh, in this incredible time. Uh, thank you. Thank you for joining this panel discussion on uh, breaking down the wall for connected customer, connected thinking, and connected experience. And uh, we really appreciate you spending time with us uh, for this session. Look, I think we all know this. In the past 18 months, the pandemic changed our way of life, you know? As individuals, as humans, we found new ways to keep going. You know, from completely shifting to remote work, uh, to ordering our home supplies online, to banking and doing payments online, you know? To, to actually thinking about healthcare and how we can, you know, how we look at our, you know, to speak with our physicians online to actually learning new skills, finding new hobbies all online. We found new ways to do things. And actually to put it simply, I think we all feel this as individuals. Technology was central in helping us navigate the last 12 months um, and potentially has changed many aspects of how we will consume technology into the future. Today, we're gonna look at the other side of the lens, not necessarily only as individuals ourselves and the consumers, but actually from the organizational side, you know? What are the organizational decisions that had to be made by different companies and people in those companies that led to making this experience a reality during the last 18 months? You know, um, governments and citizens, you know, found new ways to connect through citizen applications, contact tracing, e-government services. You know, it's been a revolution in that context around the co connected customer. Hospitals, uh, you know, healthcare has been absolutely uh, central to the last 18 months and has been in the limelight and, you know, certainly have been the heroes of, uh, of the period. Uh, but hospitals had to find and reimagine new ways for patient care, for high-risk patients. And if you think about the transportation and logistics space in industry, you know, companies found absolutely new ways to think about what that last mile of delivery is. 
Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but the underlying pivot to many of these things becoming a reality was data. You know, data was critical for driving the right policy decisions. You know, whether that was contact tracing, you know, predicting hotspots, managing essential medical supplies, you know, thinking about response planning, demand uh, planning, understanding the customer's, consumer's needs and potential behaviors. Data was absolutely critical to this entire journey. Uh, McKinsey estimates that data and analytics could create value worth between 9.5 to 15.4 trillion dollars a year if embedded at scale. And just in the public sector, 1.2 trillion dollars of value could be created uh, if, if done at scale. So let's talk a little bit more about this on how public and private industries see the role of digital solutions and data to better connect and better serve the right experience to their customers and I frankly to their stakeholders. So today we have on our panel three esteemed guests representing three countries and three very important industries that played a very critical role for society and economy during this period and will continue to. So let's call upon us and uh, panelists. So firstly, from the government sector, we have Stella Ward, the executive director of the cloud program at the Department of Internal Affairs in New Zealand. From the super app or the gig economy, you know, we have Yu Heng Lim, group managing director of public affairs at Grab. And from the healthcare industry and the leading healthcare group in Thailand, we have Kun Ratapong Ambanwong, Deputy Hospital Director, Bangkok Hospital Headquarters of the Bangkok Dusit Medical Services. So we have three esteemed guests on our panel, so let's get straight into it. So, you know, as I said earlier, in the last 18 months, technology has played a pivotal role in empowering industries, people across public, private sector. Let me start with you, Heng, yourself first. You've said before, Tech can and has to be a force for good. How has the technology played a role in supporting the community and gig workers for, you know, in this time of disruption caused by, caused by the pandemic from your lens at Grab? I, I think for us, COVID was very sudden. And frankly, um, we were scrambling for the first few months. Um, and, and so with a bit of hindsight, Looking back now at the early months, about a year ago, we, we realized that it has a lot of impact, but we also realized that it has a much bigger impact um, on people that are uh, less privileged to get access to digital services, right? We're talking about many micro SMEs. We're talking about traditional traders. Um, who cannot get online and cannot cannot sell their stuff, right? And one one good example is, uh, you know, I, I I stay in Singapore, five minutes away from a traditional market that would be really bustling now because of Ramadan, and 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 this year is the second year that's quiet. Um, we have many examples of these merchants for the first time having the need to move online, and we were quite fortunate um, to then be able to help, right? Some, some 34% of, of these merchants are, uh, not online, zero online presence, zero, um, e-commerce before COVID. Um, and we have seen, um, really a big, um, jump ahead. Now, I, I think till today, it's a bit of a hack, right? We, there was a pandemic. We just needed to get people online. We did it really quickly. And I, I think the challenge for us now is kind of how to harness that momentum that we have, with the thousands of merchants that are that is on our platform, how do we go to the next level um, beyond just you know getting online, thinking about digital marketing, digital procurement, etc. So, lots to do, um, and and we're quite um, quite happy on on the merchant front. Now on the driver side and the partner side, we have also seen this the whole you know the the power of the of 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 the platform to be able to find livelihoods. Right, we were we were able to pivot the people who are driving passengers around very quickly to delivering food, um, de delivering groceries. 
And and I was just wondering, I mean, it, it's very hard to do this in the old days, right? If somebody has to quit becoming a taxi driver and go find a job as as a delivery person, but you could you could make that pivot. We make that pivot within two weeks. All the taxi drivers, those who want, can go on to become the food delivery. So those are the kind of things I think platforms can do really well. We haven't seen anything yet. I think a lot more can come. And, and I think if you apply the technology towards the problem of digital inclusion, we can do a lot of uh, amazing things. Thank you, Yuheng. I mean, I think you've said a couple of really critical points you made here were, you know, firstly, thank you for all the work that, you know, Grab has done during this time for the gig economy, for folks that needed reskilling to where the to where the jobs were uh, and, and also supporting folks in the, uh, you know, under underprivileged uh, segments. So huge thanks for that. Um, but you said something really interesting where you're saying, look, it had to be a hack. I think sometimes the right innovation comes around when you're on the deep end and you really are willing to take risks. And this is the time where you had to take risks because the risk of the, the downside of failure was just far too much. So, you know, I think sometimes the concept of piloting and doing things irrespective of the fear of failure is just where innovation comes. And, you know, then scaling it long term makes sense, has to be done. Yeah. If I can just add, I think traditionally digitizing the small businesses have been the most difficult, right? The big bow, the big boys have have the resources to invest in technology, to invest in software and invest in capability building. But it's the small businesses, the individuals that um, find it very difficult to navigate the digital world. Uh, and I think in our own small way, we want to make the entry easy. COVID made it compelling. Um, now that they are in, the question is, what can we do about it? Not just at business level, but also individual level, right? We we also want our our driver partners to become digital, um, and, and and the gig economy can be an entry towards uh, a digital, you know, job labor market. Um, we we have an example with with Microsoft where one of our drivers recently was hired as a software engineer. It, it's the first example. We hope many will, will come. Right? Um, it's really the example of entering into the digital world um, with a compelling and easy manner and then really scaling up from there. Thank you. No, absolutely. Fully agree. So, Ratapong, I'll, I'll go to you next. I mean, look, healthcare has been one of the most important, if not the most important industry. Uh, you know, it's been in the limelight and it was the industry that needed and still does actually because we are not out of anything yet. Uh, you know, needed to kind of find new ways of connecting, right? Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, what were the things that, you know, you as an organization, as a, as a hospital chain, had to think through about reimagining that custom experience? And how did you think about looking after your high-risk patients? Yes, Rick. Yes, Ricky. Um, it's, well, actually, the technology has been involved in the healthcare industry for quite some time now. But however, after the COVID-19 pandemic, especially the current one that just hit Bangkok, um, it's very, very important and more critical from the hospital to be able to connect to our current patients because, you know, the local patient, they don't want to come to the hospital if they don't have to. They would wait because of the situation, because of the risk of infection inside the hospital. Um, more important, um, before COVID-19 pandemic, at our facility, we have about 25% of our patients are international, which, are, uh, which they always fly in to Bangkok, Thailand, and visit our facility physically. But after the pandemic, they cannot fly in. There are no flights. And there are many restrictions for them to come and seek treatment inside Thailand. So the connectivity, the connection to our current patient is the most important. So we have to create a new way or the new gateway or the new application that our patient to be able to connect with the hospital um, without coming in. So we have to use of a lot of resources and um, a lot of 
application and solution for them to connect to the hospital online. They have to be able to connect to our doctor using heavily on telemedicine technology to be able to follow them up while they're at home or that they original country. Sometimes we have to do the medication delivery to their home country or even in their home in Thailand as well. So that's a new world of doing healthcare, basically. And they have to be able to see their result from their computer, from their mobile phone. So the application has to be there and we have implemented already most of the application that they need and it is the new way of doing things because you know our our doctors or i think the doctors around the world they used to see patients face to face and be able to touch them be able to do the examination them physically but not online like this no thank you i mean like i think you know what what you what you know what what you had to go through was you know very intense in terms of uh, folks you know patients who are high risk and you know connecting the dots through online mechanisms both in terms of video as well as in terms of online delivery and logistics of of uh, uh, of medicines and supplies to to patients would have been you know um, very intense and I would love to come back and ask you a little later on uh, on what are the elements that were off top of mind at that point and making this a reality. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, move on to you, Stella. Um, you know, New Zealand has been a country that has actually demonstrated being a step ahead in many ways of uh, solving for the pandemic and, you know, being very fast to action, both in terms of policy, frameworks, et cetera, uh, but also technology. Uh, would love to get your views on some of the technology decisions you made or some of the initiatives rather that you you implemented uh, at the Department of Internal Affairs that you feel that you feel created the most impact for your citizens. Kia ora and, and thank you for the opportunity to, to be part of the panel. I do want to acknowledge that the New Zealand experience is very different from my, my colleagues on the call uh, and uh, having a strong elimination focus and closing our borders and, and being able to contain and, and now enjoy a bubble with Australia does place us in a very different um, environment uh, to, to many of our APAC colleagues. Um, I guess in terms of the Department of Internal Affairs a process, and, I'll, and I also will speak about broader government uh, activity. First and foremost, it was about supporting agencies um, and understanding those that had done the investment in digital capability were able to manage the remote working uh, situations much faster. The other for us was about managing the supply line as we saw it, an explosion in the need for um, us to be able to, for example, in our education sector, 50,000 students needing to have access to laptops and broadband capability um, at, you know, at significant speed as we um, uh, delivered uh, classroom services um, online. Uh, uh, and the other was around um, su sort of that broader support stuff. So using cloud capabilities to um, build out um, call centre capabilities to um, provide agencies with support. And then, of course, it was about well, um, additional services. Because the government um, made a number of policy decisions very quickly uh, around how it is that services would be delivered online um, ac across government agencies as much as possible. We saw um, uh, the healthcare response, and, and I know you've had Shane Hunter from the Ministry of Health as part of the the um, symposium at, already, but clearly the, the contact tracing at the, the technology in that space in terms of being able to really engage citizens in how important it was to capture that information because it would make uh, uh, their lives easier. So um, the other was very much about the public health campaign. Um, it led obviously from the from the Ministry of Health, but having the one o'clock briefings with the minister, uh, the prime minister, and uh, the Director General of Health, Dr. Ashley Bloomfield, speaking about the importance of the team of five million and how collectively we um, using. Uh, uh, 
having a very community orientated approach. So that again was also something with um, technology in terms of messaging uh, through every medium as possible to really connect people to that. And then um, there was the uh, wage subsidies. So uh, really quickly the government came in to support people who clearly were um, significantly impacted by a change to our tourism, a change to a number of different industry issues. And so the Ministry for Social Development needed to be able to quickly build out services for those wage subsidies. The other was around movement across borders. So when we when we went out of a national lockdown and went into more regional lockdown processes, we're a very long, thin country, and um, supply chain, uh, clearly from our ports and our railways and our trucking, uh, was important. And, and of course, when Auckland goes into lockdown, that had a massive impact. So again, quickly being able to process um, that uh, that that people could cross the border safely, and and that was used uh, using technology as well. So I guess the big thing for us was those agencies that were ready did much better. Uh, in terms of delivering online services uh, than uh, agencies that weren't. But every government agency uh, has had to respond by delivering services online and to be very focused on ensuring that no one misses out in that process, um, which, you know, is challenging. Yeah, thanks, Stella. I think you raise a you know, superbly important point. And actually, this is where I think public sector uh, you know, does a great job. And, and I think the private sector can learn where you all, you know, you talked about technology and key initiatives, whether it's contact tracing, online systems, all of those things are, are, are super important at this point. But you actually brought a new dimension to this, right? When you're talking a bit about, you're talking about leading across. You, you actually mm. mentioned a lot of different ministries. And, you know, to, to, to create an outcome, I think you're talking about leading across different uh, uh, ministries and, and how you've got to create the right partnerships uh, across these different ministries to create that relevant impact and that seamless experience for the citizen, right? Because you don't have one particular thing and one particular group cannot just solve for everything for that individual at the end of the day. And I love the clarity that you you have around that. And I think there's, an, there, there's, there's a learning here for the private sector to do the same thing at the you know around leading across different companies leading across different industries to solve uh, for a common situation and i guess you know things get exacerbated during the time of a pandemic but how do we learn and take this across yeah exactly and can i add that we have learned yes. and and as a result of that um really looking at um, delivering digital services across the life curve. Uh, so, you know, we, we had a very good solution around our passports and passport renewal, which you can imagine as soon as borders open, there's a significant demand on and improved security in that. But also our, through our smart start in terms of new parents, um, expecting parents being able to get access to digital services, which was a collaboration across five six different agencies um, so because um, our life curve in terms of our connection with with government agencies from from birth to death and so started with smart start and now of course we've got an end of life uh, service as well and through those experiences learning to your point that that golden thread that exists across ensuring that citizens experience um, a seamless and trustworthy and inclusive government um, in terms of a digital government environment. No, I love that. I love the way you also frame the life curve. And as I said earlier, I mean, that the partnership amongst ministries to create that uh, final outcome is, you know, is, is, is something that I think can be replicated, uh, you know, across countries, but also across uh, the, the, the private sector. Let's talk a little bit about data. I think this is something that has been, you know, it, it's in the news, right? I mean, data has been critical, as I said in the beginning, to make some of these connected uh, uh, experiences happen. Uh, but there's also some realities about data in terms of, you know, what, how much should you collect? What's the right thing? What's the balance within with, 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 with privacy? So I'd like to sort of ask the same question for all three of you. Uh, and that's really give us an example 
of how your organization is creating value um, from your data today. Um, also share with us a little bit of the tough, tough, tough decisions you have to make around data because you just can't just go collecting all the data in the, around you. And how do you make those decisions? And what's that North Star ambition for a connected thinking? So uh, long question, I know. But uh, Kun uh, Kun perhaps I can start with you. You know, you're in an interesting, you know, healthcare is an interesting area with data. So if I can start with you first. Yes. So if you could uh, give us an, an example of how your organization is creating value from your data today, and what are the tough decisions you have to make around data to make that happen? Right. Um, as a healthcare, there's a very challenging on, on data because in healthcare, we have to collect a lot, a lot, tons of data and clinical information as well. Now, I think the most important thing is that uh, previously we have to look at all the data, the important data that we collected from our patients, all the key performance indicator or the clinical indicator. And then it comes to that, all the management have to review it again, again and again. Previously, believe it or not, we collected more than 150 KPI, which we think that is too much. And many of them are not quite important as we, as we think. So we have to clean it up, first of all, and reducing them down to the minimal. So we are reducing them down to 15 to 20, the most important KPI, including whether if it is clinical or non-clinical or not. Now, um, the tool that we need to have is that the application or solution that they would gather all that information into one piece or one, one page of information that all the management can look into and connect all data to our patients so that they also can look at their important data on their solution or application that we provide to them, whether if it, it's online through their um, computer laptop or to their mobile phone. So they now they have to be able to look into their lab result. They have to be able to connect to the hospital, whether if they want to make an appointment to the doctors or if they want to cancel the appointment or if they want to change the appointment of their doctors or even if they want to look into the past history of that lab result and do the comparison, they have to be able to do that. Um, currently, um, in the past, traditional connection that we have with patients is through the traditional call center. Now we cannot do that anymore because of the current situation we receive the current, um, previously we received about 2,500 calls a day. But at this moment, because of the COVID pandemic, we are receiving about 5,000, sometimes 8,000 calls, where we have the same number of employee or staff handling the call. So the game changed where, have, where we have to switch to online or text messages or um, other form of communication or chat application for our patients to be able to connect to the hospital instead of the tra traditional call center because they cannot, they can call, but no one would answer the phone with that such a high volume. Now, when they call, we have to be able to provide them with the data that they need. So the application and solution will come into play we have to make sure that we look for the application or technology that 
would be able for our staff or our employee to be able to tell or give the information, the accurate information to our patients that using the online application. Great, thank you. So, you know, collecting a lot of data on the patients, but giving it back to them so they get timely information that is so important for themselves. Stella, back to you, same question. You know, the value that you are generating from the data and some of the tough choices you have to make. Thank you. Well, as you can imagine, government collects an awful lot of data. Um, and, uh, and, and we do have sort of three important roles across government that support us in terms of data management. So the government chief digital officer, um, which is also CEO for the internal affairs and also has the, 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 the chief privacy officer in, in there. And the, the government chief data steward uh, who sits within Statistics New Zealand and, uh, you know, who, who have a, an awful lot of data and are using the data scientists to uh, to connect that. And then obviously the the, the government CISO, um, uh, which sits within our, um, our GCSB function. And those three roles work um, across government to ensure that what data is captured um, for what purposes um, and how we are meeting the, the trust component of the digital strategy for Aotearoa, which is a core pillar in terms of trust in government by our citizens about the data that we hold on them, how we share it across government agencies and the processes that are robust around that. Uh, and then, um, and then how, how is it that we provide um, as I said, in terms of online information that they can see that we're using data to improve services uh, for for them. Um, I guess important components also are around, you know, value from the data. So value for government uh, and certainly within the Department of Internal Affairs because we have a look at all investment across government, uh, looking at using uh, data and analytics and dashboards to be speaking to how is that investment being used? How, for example, can we encourage in my program the use of cloud capabilities uh, and the speeding up of public um, sector agencies in in using a, um, cloud technologies to, to, again, be able to ensure that this secure, resilient, redundant, agile um, environments for how this data is stored and captured. I guess the uniqueness for New Zealand here is our Treaty of Waitangi um, and the Māori Crown relationship and the importance uh, around Māori data governance uh, and Māori data sovereignty in terms of how do we ensure that what we... Um, Māori perceive data as a taonga, a treasure, and so therefore how is it that we're um, digitising uh, that taonga if it's in terms of our archives environment or um, is it about services that we're delivering of value? So there's a very uh, important element around data residency, um, data processing, uh, and so a core component of um, the, the work of the government uh, at the moment inside the Department of Internal Affairs under the um, strategy pillar of trust is to look at, um, at a trust framework and a new legislation in terms of our North Star, a new legislation around digital identity and how is it that citizens will know how our data, how their data is being captured and how much data needs to be shared or how can they share data and control how that data is shared in order for us to continue to deliver great government services. Um, so a really big North Star in terms of um, our, our next direction. Uh, but I guess coming back to what and why data is so important, I mean, clearly governments cannot provide digital services without being able to as access data, secure access and, um, and storage of that data and being really, really clear that whatever we're doing and how we're doing, we're engaging our 
citizens and residents around how is it that we're using that data to better deliver services to them. So a significant part of our work program, as I said, across three accountable um, chief executives and, and agencies, uh, and then um, ensuring that the capabilities such as cloud and the analytics that can drive value such as the dashboard around investment can go back to government in terms of how is it that they're identifying next step investment to really ensure that we're delivering digital government services well. Oh, thank you, Sela. I think, I think you bring up a, a, a critical point really around having a trust framework that is deliberate and agreed upon by various stakeholders across the organization, including your privacy and security security teams, and, and, and making sure that you've got that well thought through so that you don't miss out of the opportunity to provide the best citizen services, uh, which is, you know, un, underpinned on data. Uh, you Hing, what about yourself? You know, how does Grab think through uh, the value from the data and, and, and actually, the, frankly, the, the kind of decisions you have to make? We think a lot about data, a lot, a lot. Uh, I think as as one of the, the, the everyday applications in Southeast Asia, uh, we generate lots of data. I, I think about four, 40 terabyte a day. And so that's a lot of um, data. And um, we think about a lot about how do we use this data essentially to solve each old problem that we have been, been, been grappling with in Southeast Asia. Um, one example is, you know, um, that there are something like, uh, you know, 10,000 kilometers of, of um, um, alleyways, uh, roads in, in, in Southeast Asia that's not documented anywhere. They don't have a poster code. They don't have a proper address. The road changes all the time. It's typically somewhere in the middle of a dense um, city. And what we realized was we can bring this alleyways online. We can give them an identity. We can have our drivers um, using telematics to map them. And, 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 and it's dynamic because Southeast Asia is growing so fast. It changes all the time. But we're able to bring that identity online and with that access to all sorts of you know, digital services, delivery services, ability to participate in, in the economy. Um, that's just one example of how technology can solve all problems. Another one would be traffic congestion where we had ride sharing services. How do we, how do we, you know, in the congested street of Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, how can we, how can we allow people to share using data analytics to share rides so that drivers can earn more, you can you can go to town easily um, by sharing with other people. Of course, during COVID, this service is they've uh, um, stopped the service because of COVID. But you know, pre-COVID, that was a very flexible example of that, that was an example of how we can really break trade-offs with flexibility and better income and and solving a traffic congestion problem. So we're really really excited about data solving each old Southeast Asian problems. Um, of course, with that comes. Um, responsibility of how do we manage data responsibly, um, and and so that's that's our responsibility as as first as a platform, which means we have to be, have very clear policies, very clear values, processes, um, decisions have to be made at the highest level on trade offs, um, and what what we are realizing, however, is that as the use cases gets more and more. Um, there needs to be a larger discussion. It also cannot be that decisions on privacy and data is something that's decided by just tech company alone, right? I think Southeast Asia is a very complex place that, you know, very diverse. And I think the solution that works in Singapore may not work in Cambodia, for example. And, and it's quite important that we government, tech companies, society come together and answer that question around how can we harness all this value that's sitting there because now we have a connected world and yet on the other hand manage privacy manage data security right and, and every country every region is quite different and we need to figure out the answer for for, for each of these uh, society so very exciting journey i think a lot needs to still be um, be, be discussed and decided and and i think um, tech companies have a have a huge responsibility to be part of that conversation Oh, thank you for that. I mean, I think 
you know, you bring up an interesting point that if you get this right, we can solve big, big social problems. You know, in a country-wide problems or region-wide problems, you know, you talked about Southeast Asia, it's very relevant. So last final, very quick question. Um, I think we've established the opportunity is big. And we've also established, frankly, that whether it's each one of us that are on this panel or listening in, you know, we are at the same time a citizen, a consumer, a patient. We're not different. We just have different roles in different seconds and moments of our life. Uh, and giving that, you know, keeping that in mind and the opportunity with data and but but, you know, the need to be getting this right. I guess my question for each one of you is, what do we need to do or how do you break down your internal walls and boundaries to make sure that you can collect this information to provide that experience across different companies, across different ministries and all of the above? Uh, Stella, I'll start with you. Thank you. Great, great question. I mean, I think um, I think the fact that the, the, the Department of Internal Affairs does have, and the Digital Public Service branch of New Zealand government, does have an all-of-government role. So it certainly makes it easier out the gate in terms of um, uh, getting collaboration across agencies. I think the other is to be very focused on on the end user. You know, what is the service that we're trying to provide? And then getting agencies to work out how they contribute to delivering those services. Um, and so a very personal example for me at the moment in terms of my role as um, executive director for the All of Government Cloud program uh, it, it is, a, is a concept I'm calling the Cloud Capabilities Network, um, where I'm building out communities of practice, but I'm also listening to various agencies' journeys, where they are in terms of their cloud adoption, what innovation opportunities exist for them and how they can use this technology, with the view that then another agency can hear that story, understand their processes and, and go faster um, to, to establish those services. So I, to, I've always believed in collaboration um, and the fastest way is to remember what you said. At the heart of it, we're all individuals who connect with government, with health, with um, private sector, with retail. And so thinking about how you encourage people to remember when they're sitting in their current tech role or their current health leadership role or their current government agency role, that at the end of all of this, we're trying to provide better services to the end users. Well said, Stella. Thank you. Yu Hang, what about you? I, 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 I can't agree more. I think focus on value creation for the people, for society, um, and, and that means you have to collaborate. We don't have all the answers. Um, example with collaborating with Microsoft, we know there's so many partners on our platforms. Um, many of them um, will go on to a career beyond grab. They don't want to be driving forever, right? How do we prepare them on their journey? We are not great at educating. We are, we're not an education company. Microsoft has done lots of investment into it. So we partner with Microsoft to you know, in their downtime when they're not driving, they can use the driver app and, and, and learn something about, you know, digital, about coding, about things like that. So really partnering with, with, with companies, with government to solve some problems. I think really, if you focus on the problems, I think we can really break down the barriers. Now, there still needs to be some wall, right? Privacy wall, I think needs to be there. Um, we need to make sure it's secure and, 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 and so, while we collaborate, I think we need to be quite careful about data and how we are custodian of data that has been you know, shared with us. Um, so again, I think we are all super excited about the value creation potential and the need to collaborate. But I also think we also need to spend equal amount of time to think about the relevant wars so that, so that you know, we bring value and not, and, not, and not having the risk as well. Thank you. And Kunratapam, final words from you? Yes. Um, I think the most important thing is the right people, um, the right partner who understand our business and our industry. Um, and the right solution, of course. The solution that can integrate most of the important data and information that our patient need in order to treat and service them well. For healthcare, I think data, especially in AI, will be the future of healthcare anyway. It is imminent, and especially in the clinical field. 
um, AI will play a very, very important part, especially in the patient diagnosis field. Um, I think we will see more AI helping the clinician reading the X-ray, reading the MRI, or reading the CT scan result, or even the EKG result for that matters. So, or using the chatbot in the basic medical or frequent ask questions. However, the accuracy of the AI reading has to be accurate enough accurate enough that the confidential the confidence level must be high enough so that the clinician can feel comfortable enough to trust it. So I think the wall will be broken by itself. Um, there is no other way there's no other way in healthcare that all this technology and AI will come and be a very important part in treating people's life in the near coming future. Great, thank you. Firstly, I just want to say thank you so much to all three of you, Stella, Yu Heng, Kunrata Pong. Thank you for your time. I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone who's on this uh, on this uh, uh, session has learned a lot. Really appreciate you spending the time here with us, folks. The few things you learned here: one is, you know, there's an opportunity to truly change the customer experience if we are customer centric. Uh, that's the first one. Second. Uh, look, there's an opportunity here for us to break down the walls and partner with other companies uh, across with government in order to, uh, to create that customer-centric customer experience. Uh, be it a citizen, a patient, as we talked about, a consumer, it doesn't matter. We're the same human being at the end of the day. Uh, also, the pandemic has forced us to think through innovative ideas, you know, not risk, not, not worry about the risk of failure because the risk of doing nothing was too much. Maybe we need to take that same mindset as we go beyond this and be willing to do things like pilot, innovate new ideas uh, uh, and come up with air ways in which we work in the future. So uh, look forward to that. And the backbone of all of this is data uh, and uh, you know, the opportunity for from solving big problems with data is immense, but we have to think about it. We have to think about the policy frameworks, et cetera. We have to work with the, our partners within uh, our company and across so that uh, we don't violate any core principles. Uh, with that, thank you very much for joining. Thank you to my panel. I learned a lot. I hope you did. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. As a father, I've seen firsthand the big challenges of online learning. My son, a freshman in high school, has spent the past year juggling countless tools just to do basic schoolwork. His class assignments are handed out on Zoom, study group messages come in on WhatsApp, documents are stored in Google Drive. And don't even get me started with online test taking. The question is, how can we ensure that teachers and students maximize technology to get their best learning experience? I'm Dr. Raymond Sai with AppPoint. We're the largest data management solutions provider for Microsoft 365 and have worked closely with Microsoft in the last 20 years. We've helped many learning institutions across Asia to deliver a secure, collaborative, and holistic online learning platform. With AppPoint EduTech Solution, teachers can deliver personalized, immersive, and collaborative learning powered by Microsoft 365. Our intuitive interface can automate lesson planning, exam creation, and grading. AppPoint EduTech is a one-stop shop solution that provides a student-centric learning management system with a personalized dashboard to easily attend courses and take exams, all from one place. Talk about simple. But we're also focused on safety. AppPoint EduTech can deliver secure online exams with intelligent proctoring enabled by Microsoft AI and screen monitoring for a comprehensive proctor oversight. The future of secure and collaborative online learning is here. I invite you to unleash the power of Microsoft 365 with AppPoint EduTech to take learning to the next level. Visit us at appoint.com edutech to learn more.
Thank you, Stella, Yu Heng, Kun Ratapong, and Ricky. As a consumer, patient, and citizen, I am really looking forward for that connected experience. Moving on to our last panel for this summit, let's turn our lens into the education industry that has adapted to new ways of teaching during the pandemic. We have government leaders and institution leaders joining us to talk about how we can reimagine education for tomorrow. I would like to bring upon our panel host, Anthony Salcedo, Vice President Worldwide Education at Microsoft. Anthony, take it over. Thank you so much. I couldn't think of a better way to close this amazing two days than to reflect on what has truly been a transformic, a historic transformation in education around the world. Certainly over the last year plus, we've seen the impact of the pandemic economically, sociopolitically, culturally, and the ripple effects it's had across industry. But education has actually been one of the leading change makers as, re as it relates to the way in which we learn, the way in which we will learn going forward, and the jobs that we're going to prepare students to enter will be responsible of the work that's going on in classrooms and universities around the world and across APAC. Certainly, as we've seen the initial phase of the pandemic, schools were, were focusing on responding to the needs of students and staff, keeping everyone safe and extending the learning beyond the schools and beyond the classroom. As we move to a recover phase, we're gonna be, need to be more planful about how we optimize the experiences digitally and be more purposeful on how we learn and leverage our time together on campus and in schools and classrooms around the world. We're also gonna to need to really think about the opportunity to reimagine education going forward. Reimagine the what we test and what we teach as we go forward in this new digital world. How do we think about a hybrid learning model that we sustain post pandemic? and unleash the opportunity that we've provided educators to think and teach differently in this transition. We've seen educators who were fearful of technology embrace digital tools to extend the conversation and collaboration with their students. We've seen students build skills that will be transferable as they enter the workplace and certainly build the future jobs uh, across APAC. We've also seen the use of technology mature from tools that were used to automate the learning of the past in the sides, the walls of the school and classroom to truly bringing technology forward in new ways to collaborate, learn and leverage tools and data to provide more flexibility and insight. We've got to harness the changes that we've learned over the last year with best practices and exemplars from around the world. We also know we're gonna to need to be more thoughtful about how we make this change human centric. As we've seen in successful examples, students that were thriving in immersive and digital learning environments were focused on understanding their own role and how they can leverage the tools uh, and, and starting frankly with an emotional mental well-being that was harnessed by teachers and faculty respecting the environment changing the way in which they teach and adapting the way in which they use tools to inspire learners to be at their best. We're gonna to need to continue to think differently about how we leverage the, the role of leaders going forward to drive the change, make the transformation, not only digital uh, centric, but people centric. And we've got to start there. I couldn't think of a, a time where leadership matters more as we transform education in what has truly been a historic change inspired by the pandemic. I also couldn't think of two better leaders to reflect on the change across APAC and really share their insights and learning from our two panelists today. And I want to remind you before I introduce our amazing panelists to take time to reflect in the chat, add to the dialogue, and certainly if there are any questions, feel free to call them out. And I can certainly incorporate that into the dialogue that we're going to have. So please join me in welcoming two leaders who are truly transforming the work that they do and certainly uh, the response to the pandemic has been certainly in their hands to drive change. Please join me in welcoming Under Sec Secretary Elaine Pascua from the Department of Education in the Philippines and Alvin Ong, Chief Information Officer from Nyang Technological University here in Singapore. Thank you both for joining and thank you very much for aligning to the panel uniform that we didn't actually intend to set out. So I'm going to start with a question, and I'd love your bo both of you to start feedback, and maybe we can start with Alvin. Uh, so for a little over a year, 
uh, I'd love for you to share maybe one or two key lessons on how your organizations have experienced the change, how you responded, and what are some of the key learnings that maybe you were surprised by throughout the journey? Mm. Okay, sure. Uh, thanks, Anthony. Uh, let me just recap. 2020 was a remarkable year in the sense that uh, the world faced a massive disruption caused by an invisible enemy, the COVID virus, and Singapore was not spared. So I remember very clearly on 23rd January, which was the eve of a major public holiday, we Singapore had our very first case of COVID-19. And over the next few days and weeks, the number of cases started to increase. And by the time we reached end of February and, and March, it was clear that this virus has, the number of cases caused by this virus has increased exponentially. And so at the university, we, we had to make a decision in order to keep our community of 33,000 uh, students and 9,000 faculty, staff safe and still functioning productively, we had to pivot very, very quickly to remote ways of working and learning, teaching and assessments without affecting the university's operations. And we were able to pivot very quickly. Uh, it was not an overnight thing. We were sure. able to pivot very quickly because in the last two years, we had made a massive uh, digital transformation of almost all our legacy systems, transforming them to cloud, to cloud first and mobile enabled, which enabled our, our faculty, our students to be able to work anywhere and to be able to learn and teach anywhere. So one, one major lesson learned is uh, digital transformation has to be digital maturity and digital transformation has to be planned way ahead of time. And we have to gradually move and prepare ourselves before we can, before we face major crises like this pandemic. And it's also very important to think about the future architecture of IT in, a, in terms of making ourselves cloud, leveraging on cloud, enabling our infrastructure to be accessible anywhere. So this was the one of the major learnings. The other is to is to reimagine our processes to also make our processes less dependent on paper flow, fiscal paper flow, so that we we can we can uh, work anywhere. So we were quite lucky in the sense that the preceding two years before COVID, we managed to automate most of our processes such that we will continue we even continuing to be able to pay our salaries on time. We were able to process uh, procurement on time. So can you imagine if we didn't do that, we would not be able to uh, to be able to survive the COVID. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. first of all, I love the, the, love the reflection on the, the back office optimization and, and automation work that you've done. Uh, you also reflect on something that I think I've seen globally as I've engaged with schools and universities, that the institutions that have been most successful in the transition, because this was a rapid change for everyone, were institutions that had a plan ahead of time. Either they were on a path to um, modernize and digitize a lot of their environments, or they at least had a plan for how they were you're going to use technology uh, and certainly the cloud more actively. And certainly that reflects in the work that you've done in Nyan. Uh, Elaine, I'd love to uh, hear from, uh, from you on some of the broader changes that you're driving across the Philippines. Good day, uh, Anthony and Alvin. Thank you. From uh, March of 2020 up to today, face-to-face -to -face classes here in the Philippines have been suspended and remain to be suspended. How then did we continue to deliver basic education to complete the fourth quarter of the previous year, which was about to start that time in March 2020 when strict quarantine was imposed? And how did we begin the next school year, which we started last August of this year, when quarantine restrictions were still in place? We are currently in the third quarter of that school year. Our answer last March 2020 was the immediate publishing and making live of the DepEd Commons, our online platform that provides open educational resources to our teachers and learners. We have been planning for that, we have been doing that, but we have not yet made live 
that platform because we are not ready at the time. These are teacher-made materials which have been created for the last six months when our EdTech units started having trainings and seminars on OERs and emerging technologies. We rushed to finish these materials and upload them in the DepEd Commons to make them accessible to teachers, learners, and their parents. About 8 million unique users immediately access it, though this is not quite representative of the 67% connectivity and internet penetration in our country. Nevertheless, it was quite a surprise for us to have this record number. Then we negotiated with the major telecommunications companies to whitelist the DepEd Commons, and we were successful in that. The private telecommunications companies immediately forged partnership with the Department of Education in providing free access, no data charges, to the DepEd Commons. Before the start of the following year, in August of 2020, and recognizing that only 67% of the population is connected and has internet connectivity, we then embark on developing DepEd TV to reach out to 16 million households. The curriculum and instruction strand, on the other hand, reduced the learning competencies of K-12 curriculum from more than 14,000 to about 6,000 or almost 6,000 most essential competencies. These competencies or most essential competencies became the basis for our teacher broadcasters to produce TV episodes for the DepEd TV, which is now being aired via free TV of the government station, via black boxes or digital boxes of major TV networks, via cable TV networks throughout the country, and via satellite dishes of satellite-based TV networks. The DepEd Commons and the DepEd TV complement and support the self-learning modules and the blended learning framework that we have adopted. To capacitate our teachers to use these technologies and platforms, we conducted series of webinars and virtual in-service trainings and we were able to reach out just in the last uh, previous month about half a million uh, participants, teacher participants, and almost about five million viewers you know, or views in this uh, few, in this few, uh, in in a few of these webinars. Several servers of edtech applications even crashed because of the massive participation of our teachers. Lessons: If there are no face-to-face -face classes then we have to devise any and all means to reach out to our learners and to bring basic education to them. We have to educate by all means. We have to teach by all means. And our learners have to learn by all means. What does all means refer to? We look for all available tools in the confines of our offices and homes and make these tools for the delivery of education services. We look at the internet. We look at the cell phones, we look at the television sets, the radios, also the books and the printed modules. We use all of these tools for the delivery of basic education. And I think that has been a challenge to us here in the Philippines. Well, I think first off, thank you very much for your reflection. And I, I have been impressed by DepEd's focus on really embracing both the complexity of the challenge that you've uh, dealt with but many different tools and approaches that you've been willing to try and provide. Certainly you highlighted the importance of connectivity. Uh, certainly this is a challenge for uh, countries around the world. The need to leverage partnerships and various mediums, whether it's cell phones, whether it's television broadcast, uh, those are gonna be part of not only the, the response, but I think the, the ways in which we use our tools uh, and think differently about the options for learning beyond the, the pandemic. So with that in mind, I wanted to really get us back to the theme of reimagine education. We often talk about the desire certainly to get past the pandemic and get back to school. But I, I recognize that most of us recognize there's no going back to normal. And I'm curious of your reflection on, hey, how do you think about this as it relates to reimagining education? Is this something that you think we have an opportunity to do um, do you think that there's willingness across your constituents to try to change and, and really learn from what we've uh, started to build in the pandemic, building on some of the trends that existed long before COVID-19? And I'd love some insights that you have across what you're putting in sort of Nayang and certainly in the Philippines 
on drivers for change. So maybe we can start with you, Alvin, on what what are you thinking about the new normal? Is it something that you're rushing to or embracing? What are some of the insights and um, and considerations that you have as you go about bringing that to, to your institution? Yeah, sure, I'll be, I'll be glad to. And certainly I can say that we'll, we will never go back to the past again. So the new normal is a permanent normal. Uh, I like to frame the reimagining education in probably five attributes. What are five attributes which I see will impact education uh, in terms of flexibility, accessibility, accessible, engaging, collaborative, and holistic. So let me let me just go uh, point by point. So you so flexible. So university education has been traditionally very front front loaded. In the sense that we we go to university, we spend several years pre-work, and we get all the ed- education we want, and then we go to the sure. workforce. Sure. So the education of the future will, will be more flexible. It's no longer going to be front-loaded. It will be rotational, rotational way of education. That means it will emphasize study, work, study, work, and then you go back to study when you need to, and then you you go and work. So this. This is how we see uh, education, how it will be like. And university education would also be focusing on uh, lifelong learning. So you, higher education would have a big role to play in terms of keeping our graduates upskill and reskill all the time. So that's the first point. So the second point I'd like to make on re-imagine, reimagining education will be accessible. So. So traditionally, we have been uh, assessing students based on their grades, how well they do in the pre, pre-university before we accept them. So I, I see a trend in which uh, we will look at other attributes other than just the grades of the students when we accept students into university. So, so it will be based on maybe their skills in certain areas or maybe they are extremely good at software programming. So admission criteria will be more holistic and we incorporate aptitude-based admission. Uh, thirdly, uh, thirdly will be engaging. So education of the future will be very engaging. It will incorporate face-to-face, online learning, hybrid learning, blended learning, uh, flipped classrooms. So we will be multi-modal forms of learning and it will also have experiential learning, learning outside of the classroom, learning even learning at companies, working with companies, having internship, student exchange. So the learning education of the future will be engaging too. And it will be also based on pedagogical research, based on neuroscience, based on uh, science of learning, art of learning, and technology of learning. That's the third point. So the fourth point, the fourth point is collaborative. So universities have been traditionally cooperating and collaborating with other universities on joint degree programs. But I see there's a trend for universities to collaborate more with industries and even tech giants such as Microsoft to even co-create and co-deliver content to prepare uh, workers of the future and leaders of the future. And lastly, the university education will be holistic in the sense that we will focus more than just academic results, but it also be developing the whole person. So in NTU, we have a three C's of education. So you develop character, you develop competency, as well as cognitive agility. And we will also look into the, the well-being of students their mental and physical well-being also to help students to be able to adjust in the very pressurizing environment. So I see, the, in a nutshell, I see education affected in, really imagine in five ways. They'll be flexible, they'll be accessible, they'll be engaging, they'll be collaborative and holistic. So these are some of my initial thoughts. I think that's a great foundation and certainly things that we certainly should keep forward. And I know that we're all going to be working hard to deliver on many of those points. And uh, and certainly, Elaine, I'd love to learn a little bit more from your point of view on what you're doing to embrace the new normal. Yeah. 
when we when we resume uh, face to face classes under the new normal the question that uh, we have in mind or we have been asked is do we redesign our classrooms partly yes uh, for we have to rewire them or wire them and bring technology in all our facilities as this will help our teachers teach and our learners learn better you know? aside from technology you know, our facilities will remain as they are having been already being uh, built that way but we might change the physical setup to just one table and one chair uh, for social distancing you know? currently we have one table two chairs you know? uh, two learners are sitting uh, side by side with uh, each other we may also need to infuse additional interventions in our hand washing facilities toilets potable water supplies all uh, things that are hygiene and health related uh, materials and requirements but do we abandon our online and broadcast platforms that we had created under this new normal when face to face classes are already possible actually i am advocating that we continue with them you know? the problem of school facilities in the philippines is the shortage of classrooms you know? we are still short of more than 150,000 classrooms to have the ideal number of learners to a room which is about 40 to 45 but if we maintain our distance learning platforms and modalities we immediately solve that classroom shortage if half of the learners population goes to school three times a week and then learn at home for the rest of the week and with the other half doing the same for the other days we have initially solved that classroom shortage. You know? The facilities will no longer limit our learning and our education. So we need to master distance learning now, you know? making all the necessary improvements and perfecting all our processes for the DEPED Commons, the DEPED TV, the DEPED Radio, the DEPED Learning Management System, the DEPED Mobile App, and others. This is how we reimagine education under this new normal how the public schools of the future must be shaped up now with this kind of platforms i think it is really uh, not only worthwhile reimagining education but really doing what needs to be done under this new normal i think that's great i love the resilience and focus that you have i think a lot of what you both shared uh, overlaps the need to be super purposeful holistic uh, in the ways that you respond, flexible in the learning modalities that we're gonna need to embrace going forward, uh, and certainly putting the student at the center in terms of their journey and skills development as they uh, embrace what is going to be a changing workplace. And I love in that regard, you, you both shared such amazing insight. If you could take me backstage a little bit, maybe behind the curtain, on a couple of examples that you're both working on, or maybe have already started planning to help reimagine learning, reimagine education in your organization. Maybe how technology is helping you achieve uh, some of that reimagining as well. So maybe we can start with you, Alvin. Yeah, sure. Maybe I, I can just give one example that uh, we have, NTU has gone on this uh, flipped classroom uh, way of uh, teaching and learning in which students would get assignments to, to read or they can watch videos and they come to class for assignments. So in several years ago, we have been, we have redesigned our classrooms to make them smaller and uh, more interactive. So you have like tables where like five people can gather and we have replicated that throughout the, the university in, in our, we have two buildings. One is called the Hive, the other called the Up. So, so after, from the experience of this COVID, we, we find that we will need to redesign our classrooms to, in order to cater for blended ways of learning, hybrid ways of learning, where sure. some will be online and some will be maybe somewhere else. So that is a, a, a initiative right now to reimagine how the classrooms of the future will be redesigned. And we call that our next generation learning space. So this is this is a project that would take some time for us to to work out and fine tune what's the the right balance between technology and between engagement and face to face and this is something that we will be working on and we are already working on. I love that it's not only about being more effective with the use of digital tools. It's going to be more 
uh, dynamic on how we leverage our time together. What do we use our space? How do we leverage the buildings and the rooms inside of our, our institutions? I, I certainly see that blend and certainly thanks for sharing. Um, uh, Elena, anything you want to share in terms of what DepEd is working on? Yes. Uh, this pandemic also teaches us to connect not just the schools and our offices into one connectivity network, but also the households. For when face-to-face -face classes are not possible and quarantines restrict movements, connectivity of households of learners to households of teachers and officials become really essential. This is where our concept of the public education network came into being. We have to make our schools connect to one another and to the DepEd offices across all governance level. They have to connect horizontally and vertically and be able to push contents and messages even without internet bandwidth. With this network, schools will become connectivity hubs for all the households around it so that contents are also made available to every learner in the community even without internet bandwidth. If this, if this connectivity is reinforced by internet bandwidth, then it is a big leap forward. If all other devices such as televisions, radio, cellular phones, etc., can be connected via this hub and network, then we can really harness the advantages of technology in the delivery of education. We are also preparing the groundwork now for the creation of what we call temporary called DEPED Play or EdFlix, Education Flix. We would want the DEPED TV episodes to be available in a Netflix type user interface of videos on demand in whatever device our learners have. With this platform and in combination with all others, learning may be done in a pace chosen by the learners themselves. Those who need more time and repetition can easily review and go back to all the lessons. While those who learn in a faster pace can access new lessons and other lessons outside of their grade level. Their parents, wherever they are, whether they are overseas or in the offices, can easily mentor their children as the same lessons are made available to them online. Teachers, on the other hand, will be encouraged, they forced to innovate and expand their lessons as the level of appreciation of their learners will increase over time. Of course, uh, Microsoft Teams is an online collaboration platform in governance and even in education and classroom interaction will play a major role. Just imagine almost 1 million DEPED personnel, including teachers, and more than 26 million learners throughout the country need to know and use Microsoft Teams for all these undertakings to be possible. Now we are already also exploring a partnership between the education department and the business sector. We are actually introducing to our grade 10 to 12 learner, these are the 16 year olds and above, and the sure. senior high school student, about 3 million of them right now, to start using LinkedIn to build their resumes. And we are reaching out to the business sector to use the same platform to identify the workforce they need coming from the senior high, grad, high school graduates. So we would want to know what the business sector is looking for, what kind of employees they want to hire, which skills and expertise they need. And with that kind of interface, our education curriculum now can be transformed and can adapt to the needs of the entire nation and even the world. Then our basic education becomes really relevant and liberating for it serves what our nation needs and what the world needs. Thank you for sharing. We're actually seeing that need uh, tremendously all around the world where the, the dynamics of the changing workplace is providing a need to help educate students on how do they build and prepare skills for the jobs of the future? And how do we make the experience of learning more relevant and connected to how students are seeing the, what they're studying and what they're taking tests on connected to the industries and their passions to go forward? Uh, Microsoft just released a tool called Career Coach recently for universities to mm. take insight from LinkedIn and actually help mm. guide students on career readiness and skill building as they're in, in education to get ready for the future. Uh, so I think we're absolutely aligned to, to that thinking for sure. And Undersecretary, I'd love to um, ask, we have a few more minutes for some quick questions, but there's been some good dialogue in the chat. And I think a lot of folks are inspired by the digital vision that you're articulating, but recognizing that there's really two things that we must solve. 
We've got stress teachers, and I, I certainly see this around the world where teachers are, are embracing so much change. Uh, they're dealing with so many different uh, tools and new experiences that they've got to transition to. And then increasingly, how do we address the digital divide? I know you've provided some really thoughtful examples, but I'm curious about if you can maybe share your reflections on how are we going to help support the teachers in this change? And, and what, what are the steps that we must take to address this inequity uh, that we have in, in the Philippines and in every country in the world, frankly? Yeah. This time, for example, uh, in a way of support to our teachers, we also have uh, several webinars and uh, several assemblies with them on mental health issues. No? So we, we try to uh, put up those uh, stress yeah. factors and other matters that would really burden them. No? At the same time, uh, we are rushing to provide them with, say, for example, connectivity loads that would make them, that would enable them to connect whatever device they have and whatever telecommunications company they are subscribed to, and even provide tools, ICT equipment to them. Uh, and we have been rushing all these things. We have been making representations with Congress, with the Department of Budget and Management, so that we could really provide uh, adequate support for them. No? And uh, our education department, including in the curriculum uh, and instruction strand, are, really, are really making sure that uh, our teachers will not be so stressful in this time of crisis. No? And uh, actually, we have also experienced, even myself, that working under this pandemic is really harder than working in the previous normal. For sure. Uh, so, Teaching also is it's really Absolutely. very became harder this time uh, because of this pandemic. So, but we cannot we cannot let this pandemic hinder us from working and hinder hinder us from teaching. So we have to devise those means at the same time rally and mobilize support to make things easier for every one of us. Yeah, I, I appreciate that feedback. As as someone who's been working with teachers and technology for a few decades. Many educators were fearful that the rise of technology would diminish their value. What happened in the pandemic is we've got very good clarity on not only the importance of teachers, but truly the hard work that they're delivering, the care and work that they're embracing to change and embrace uh, different approaches to teaching. Uh, it's been phenomenal. And certainly I'm hopeful that when we uh, close the book on the pandemic and we celebrate our first responders, uh, uh, doctors and nurses that have been so critical to helping our citizens, that we certainly recognize the importance of celebrating the role teachers have played uh, in really helping us move past this pandemic. And certainly I have been humbled by the work that's going on. So thank you very much for that reflection. And maybe one last question, Alvin, I think a lot of people were super excited about the vision that you laid out uh, and really the future being more accessible, more flexible, not just based on grades for admission, but looking at yeah. really the holistic uh, student-centered approach to aptitude and engagement. Mm -hmm. I'm curious uh, from the, the chat, how long do you think this is going to take to change? Uh, do you think that we're going to deal with some resistance? Do you think this is going to something that's going to move fast, or do you think it's going to be many, many years ahead? Yeah, thanks, Anthony. And in fact, in fact, it happened last year. So last <laughs> last year, last year we had already as a university, we had already undertaken to allow to allocate a certain percentage of uh, places to students based on this new aptitude-based admission. And next, next year, we are also looking into, because we have several thousand of these uh, students apply, and sometimes they have, to, they have to write essays. So we are even looking into how we can leverage on AI, machine learning, text mining, to help us uh, even filter some of these uh, essays that were written by students. So the answer to that is, we have already started looking at admission based on aptitude last year and for in the future we will look into how we can even make the process more productive leveraging on technology and tools such as machine learning absolutely well uh, th this has been a really great conversation i wish we can talk for several hours further um, because this is an important topic i think you both gave some really thoughtful insights i think some common themes that came out uh, being student-centered and really holistically uh, focusing on wellness and mental well-being, understanding how we're building students, the skills for the future and the future of work, 
How are we more flexible in the way in which we deliver learning across a variety of different tools as Undersecretary shared, as well as different uh, modalities in and out of the classroom across university? Uh, how are we embracing the need to be urgent and purposeful in the ways in which we reimagine education and embracing this new normal that will be here to stay um, with focus, with energy, and recognizing that the investment in education, it's truly that an investment, is an imperative for not only social well-being across every country, but the economic growth that we so much want to drive across government. And we've got to work more, more closely with partners, with corporations, uh, with urgency and authenticity as we embrace this change. Both of you are, are making that happen and certainly doing a, a lot of hard work to drive change across the institutions that you serve. Thank you so much for sharing your vision and insight. And thank you very much for the work that you do uh, and will continue to do to help reimagine education. So that's it for the panel. Thank you all for joining uh, and back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Yusek Elaine, Alvin Ong, and Anthony. Great to see how we are reimagining education for the future leaders of tomorrow. With that, before we end our conversation, I would like to call Andres Ortola, General Manager, Microsoft Philippines, to summarize our two-day summit. I want to start by thanking each one of you for spending time with us over the last two days of the summit. Once again, we want to thank Right Honorable Prime Minister Tan Sri Mugidin Yazin of Malaysia, Right Honorable Prime Minister General Prayut Chan Ocha of the Kingdom of Thailand, Minister of Foreign Affairs Dr. Vivian Balakrishnan of the Republic of Singapore, Honorable Minister of State-Owned Enterprises Eric Tohir of the Republic of Indonesia for sharing your bold and inspiring vision for your countries. Over the last two days, we had many industries from government, healthcare, education, and many others, alongside other international institutions and our partners, come together to advocate empowering nations for a digital society. We heard from leaders on how technology has empowered the front line in their response to the pandemic and how COVID-19 has accelerated their transformation through the adoption of technology. Yesterday, we heard from Bozina of the World Bank, who asserted that our future is clearly digital, shifting at a pace never imagined or experienced before. But while technology is clearly important, it is only as good as the empowerment and impact it brings to people's lives. The future of digital society must be built on the pillars of trust, inclusion, growth, and security, all of which must be in service of people. COVID-19 has exposed many vulnerabilities and deepened the digital divide across nations and societies. As leaders, it is our responsibility to ensure inclusive access, leveraging technology to reach the millions of people across this region of the world and empower them with the necessary skills needed to thrive in this digital era. We have a historic opportunity to act now and collectively shape our future together. Many of our discussions the past two days underlined the importance and potential of alliances and coalitions. We're witnessing the capacity of this multiplier effect as governments, organizations, communities, and individuals all over the world are working together to combat COVID-19. We're confident that our collective partnerships can achieve more. Once again, thank you for joining us this past two days. Our Microsoft teams are your allies and we look forward to forging a better, brighter future ahead with you. Thank you, Andreas, and thank you everyone for joining us for this two days summit. Please do share your experience by scanning the QR code or just by clicking the link on the chat window. We trust the two days provide you with ideas, insights, and clarity on the path forward. We wish you all the very best. Stay safe, and remember, the future is ours to define.